All right, so welcome to this training on Applied Housing First and Harm Reduction Strategies. My name is Ryan Villagrant, and I use they and them pronouns, and I'm a training specialist with Housing First University. Uh, so if you hadn't been in one of our trainings before, uh, over the last couple of years, uh, we've done kind of a series of trainings around Housing First and harm reduction and, and best strategies for service provision. Um, we do training on Housing First. That's that's our whole gig, We and we love to do it. Um, and so we're the training institute out of Pathways to Housing PA. So Pathways is a homeless services organization operating out of North Philadelphia, uh, and we've been doing Housing First work in that community uh, since about 2008. Uh, we sprang out of the original Pathways to Housing in New York City, which is where the Pathways to Housing model comes from, the Housing First model. Uh, and so when you hear people talk about Housing First, um, often that is a direct reference to the Housing First model that kind of sprang out of New York City. Um, so we kind of separated from, from the OG Pathways in about 2013. And um, at this point, um, having grown from one clinical team of people that we were serving, about 70 to 80 folks, uh, we're now serving close to 600 folks and serving in housing up to 600 folks. Um, so we do that in a scattered site model. People have their own apartments. We're using HUD vouchers for that. Uh, and it is not without its many challenges, right? Trying to help people just maintain tenancy. What can we do to keep them off the landlord's radars and, and all that stuff? So we're going to talk about a lot of that today. Um, and I'm really excited to do it. Before we jump any further, let me just pause and allow my co-presenter to introduce himself, uh, and then I'll walk us through some housekeeping. Thanks, Ryan. Good morning, everybody. My name is Kahlo. My pronouns are he, him, and his. Um, I am currently a therapist right now. That is what I do. Um, but I am also still connected to kind of harm reduction and housing work through um, our local syringe exchange here in Philadelphia called Prevention Point. Uh, but Prior to um, becoming a therapist and, and doing that full time, uh, I was working at Pathways to Housing PA with Ryan as a training specialist. And before that, I was leading the poly substance use team there. So uh, moving folks directly from the street into their houses, most for the first time, uh, which is pretty rewarding work. I really love harm reduction and to talk about it. So um, yeah, I'm excited. Awesome. Uh, so some quick housekeeping we wanted to walk you all through. Uh, I know it's easy to uh, multitask and and you know maybe chop away at some emails while you're in today's training. We just want to gently invite folks to be present with us if possible. Uh, shut down your email, flip over your phone for a couple of hours. Uh, I think if you're able to do that, um, we will have a pretty good discussion about some of the challenges, the rewards, and and some some cool tips and tricks around housing first and harm reduction. Um, Kyle and I would love to welcome questions and comments throughout the training. Um, if you're having a question come up, don't be afraid that you're going to derail the training. Don't be afraid that uh, your question is not relevant. Would love to just kind of deal with that in the moment, right? Like let's let's engage in a dialogue. So um, you know, use the chat, use the Q and A box if that's if that feels right. Um, I think we can consider raising hands on the Zoom platform, but we may not um, invite everybody to unmute depending on where we're at with time, uh, since we're a large group today. Uh, we are able to offer CE credit for folks. So if you're a licensed social worker of some kind, um, make sure you do the, a couple of things that we need for our accrediting body. Uh, so make sure you stay the whole time, make sure you're participating in our discussions and make sure your camera's on so we can check in and see that you're there. Um, we'll also need you to complete a course evaluation at the end of the session. And that'll be how you indicate, yes, I'm a social worker. Yes, I need credit. Even if you don't need credit uh, under social work, uh, you're not seeking CEs, uh, we we really invite folks to complete that course evaluation. Let us know what you thought about the content. Let us know what you thought about the presentation. Um, did you get what you hoped out of it? Any other comments, questions that you wanted to add would be great there. Um, last bit here, we'll take a short break uh, in the somewhere in the middle of the training. Don't like to be too prescriptive about that. Why not kind of let the training dictate how we're feeling about that? Um, one more housekeeping slide. I want to just make a, some notes about accommodations. Uh, we we asked for accommodation requests in the Zoom registration. Um, and so we've attempted to meet those requests, right? If anybody kind of indicated that they needed something for accessibility, we we tried to meet those needs. Um, but if there are other requests, if you're if something is coming up for you in terms of helping you um, get the most out of this training today, we really strongly invite you to um, 
privately message one of ourselves and we'll see what we can do along the way. Um, other things that we'll be doing, we have the closed captioning enabled. And we will be um, attempting to read out loud the questions and comments that come in in the chat, right? So that folks who are listening along can, um, can access those questions. And then we've attempted to provide high contrast text and backgrounds for visual uh, acuity. So again, please send any ad additional requests that you may have along the way. So here's our agenda. Here's what we're gonna cover today. Um, we're gonna spend some time exploring stigma, understanding its impact uh, and understanding the impact of shame for people who are receiving supportive services in a, in a housing first type context. Um, we will spend some time also reviewing key concepts of harm reduction and the housing first philosophy. So it won't be a deep dive into each of those since we've done some of that in the past with through the Housing Alliance of Delaware, but we'll review it. Uh, and if you do have specific questions that come up, uh, we'll, we'll try and address that. We'll also explore very kind of concrete and specific harm reduction strategies that we're using pretty regularly in a housing first context. Uh, and, and definitely would invite additional strategies uh, as you think of them and want to put them in the chat. And then we're going to spend quite a bit of time. I, I hope that we can spend maybe nearly half of our time together exploring case studies, right? And so we're going to introduce some tools to you and then introduce some case studies from our own work and see kind of where do you think these tools fit? What other tools do you think would fit? How do we apply the principles of harm reduction in cases like this? Uh, and then we'll have an opportunity to pull back the curtain and talk about what we actually did with these real cases. Um, so I think I think we'll get a lot out of it. We'll, we'll make use of the breakout groups so that you can have some actual discussion and get in there. Um, I'm excited about that. And then we'll have some time, hopefully, for some Q&A near the end of the session. In terms of learning objectives, by the end of this session, it's a three hour session today to give kind of ample opportunity for discussion, case study review, et cetera. Uh, we hope you'll walk away with these three learning objectives in hand. We want you to be able to define the role of harm reduction in housing first practice. How's it used, why, et cetera. We want you to be able to list three harm reduction tools to engage with folks around risky behaviors. Uh, and we'll talk about the way that we broaden our concept of risk beyond just the opioid. Uh, use that may, may, may be there. And then we'll uh, hope that you'll be able to demonstrate the application of harm reduction tools through our, our discussion of case studies. All right, we are ready to launch into our content. Uh, so I'm going to kick it over to Khalil to take us through kind of a review of some key concepts to lay the groundwork. Awesome. So the first kind of um major concept we'll review um, is the idea of stigma, right? It's purpose and impact. Um, one of the things we know about stigma, or one of the things like I would like folks to know about stigma is that this is kind of normal and that we are also like perpetuators of this thing we call stigma, right? And we can be actively working to kind of, um, to not be that way or operate in that way um, so consistently. Uh, but one of the things I want to do first is normalize the, the reasons that we do it and do engage um, in, in, in kind of pushing this forward and maintaining um, some harmful stigma. So one of the reasons um, is that stigma creates difference, right? When we can keep people out, we don't have to deal with what they've got going on, right? We can keep our lives separate. I'm not that. They are not me. Um, they're different from me, right? Our problems are different. Our solutions are going to look different. Um, and I don't need to kind of engage in, in whatever is going on, right? And probably substance use is probably what we'll talk about most in the, when it comes to harm reduction, but um, yes. Um, stigma also helps us to keep people away, right? When we stigmatize, when we stigmatize folks, sometimes that represents a danger, right? And it makes sense to wanna to keep ourselves safe and to be around people and communities um, and settings that, that make us feel safe. So as much as we can do, um, to keep danger away from us um, is a good thing or should be a good thing, right? Um, so one of the things we're talking about stigma is like, what what actually is unsafe, right? What is dangerous to me and what is just uncomfortable? Um, and then it's also used largely on kind of um, a broader scale to discriminate against folks, right? To keep people down um, and uh, again, out, like we already said. So. Uh, I say all this to say that stigma does serve a purpose uh, and it makes sense for us all to be engaging in like reinforcing stigma. 
Um, but when it comes to serving the folks that we do, so in homelessness settings, mental health settings, substance use settings, um, they're experiencing a ton of this, right? So learning to uh, learning different strategies to reduce this as much as we can um, helps to kind of um, reduce this a little bit. And here are some of the reasons we kind of want to kind of be working toward reducing stigma, right? Um, I think the major reason we want to be working to like actively reduce stigma is because it actively harms people, right? It actively harms the folks and damages the people that we are working with on a regular basis. Um, when folks are slapped with stereotypes and labels, right? Um, this means something, this impacts their day to day, right? Um, we know that stereotypes are made up of, um, or stigma is made up of the stereotype and the label, right? So for someone experiencing homelessness, um, the stereotype might be they're lazy, right? The label we're giving them um, is, I don't know. I don't know, I'm lost for words. At a loss for words right now, but maybe a junkie or an addict or something. Yeah, like that. Th there's the label, right? These are like so far removed from our vocabulary sometimes in these spaces that we we can forget. But the label we're tacking onto that is something like like junkie, right, or or lazy, or they're unmotivated. Um, for something that is it can be something much more simple, right? This is this is what homelessness looks like. Um, but we also know that folks um, begin to like internalize. Uh, some of this stigma, right? This external stress that they're experiencing um, on the day to day. And what that looks like sometimes, uh, I think the way I like to talk about this is if you've ever heard in your own settings, uh, I can't help somebody more than they want to help themselves, right? Or I can't work harder than my client, or this person doesn't want help. I think that's a huge one when we fall into like, oh, I'm not helping this person because they don't want help, right? I think when it comes to stigma and all of the harmful kind of um side effects of of that is that i think it's probably true i think it's likely true that folks begin to kind of like internalize and believe that they're not worthy of help and support right so it's not that they don't want it all the time right with all these external stressors and things that folks are experiencing um about uh their substance use their mental health their housing status um they begin to maybe kind of believe some of that right um and one of the ways we can also help kind of combat stigma is apply this to your own life, right? How many times have people told you, you are this thing, right? And it didn't feel so good, right? But maybe there's something in the back of your head setting, saying or prompting you to ask yourself, am I this thing, right? Um, am I not worthy of connection or love or support um, from the folks around me? Um, so all this to say that stigma does have a very observable kind of impact on folks too. So I have some um, some stats, some data, some numbers about um, stigma or how stigma has kind of um, creeped its way into the opioid epidemic and some substance use stats to share with folks. Um, so one of uh, the kind of bigger, the larger numbers um, is that 81,000 people died of unintentional overdose between June, 2019 and May, 2020. Uh, so one month shy of, of a year. Um, and I think another surprising statistic is that only 20% of people with opioid use disorder ever seek treatment for it, right? But if we can chip away at some of these things that we see on the screen, right? Um, increasing those opportunities, right? Not expecting folks to act um, or engage in treatment in specific ways. I mean, kind of removing those stereotypes and labels, right? Maybe that 20% of people um, seeking treatment could could grow pretty significantly, right? If there aren't all these negative feelings about what it looks like to act to actively seek um, that care and support from folks. Um, but again, a lot of this can come from what folks are believing about themselves, right? That internalized and reinforced stigma about what it looks about what it means to have a substance use disorder or to have a severe mental illness um, or to be experiencing street homelessness. We will move right on to shame and stress. Um, so I think many folks in the helping professional space are very familiar with the idea that shame and stress um, has negative impacts on our brains, on our bodies, um, and our connections um, to the world and to other people. Um, 
it's important to recognize that that it's built into our culture, right? Even if we take this outside of uh, kind of the helping profession, right? Um, I think about um, the school setting, right? Or kids, or I've observed like very young people saying like, why are you eating that, right? Or that's too much sugar, right? What does it look like for a child to communicate that? Is It's a little bit shameful, right? And increasing shame for other folks too. Like this thing that I'm eating right here, has too much sugar and now I'm ashamed, right? Um, a small example that kind of exists outside of the helping professional space, but I think one that is kind of easy to understand. Um, but really we say this uh, to say and to ask like, how does he bring on more shame? Uh, help somebody, right? Is this, how, this is kind of like maybe the tough love thing. Is this how we get people to change um, and to pursue recovery and treatment? Um, this third bullet point I really appreciate. Participants know when they've made a mistake. Um, many times we're working with adults, right? Who have lived long, full lives of experiences and interactions with other people, right? And they're not, they are experiencing kind of the consequences, natural consequences uh, of maybe some poor decisions on a pretty regular basis, right? Living on the street doesn't feel good. And I'm not saying to say that that's somebody's fault, but folks know that they might have had a hand in, in some way or another in like contributing to current circumstances. And that maybe, yeah, folks know when they messed up. That is the story in a nutshell. Um, but what we can be doing to kind of reduce shame and stress for folks is reaffirming our commitment to support for them. Um, and then also not turning people away when they present with the same kind of conditions and experiences and behaviors that they showed up to us seeking support for. Um, the example I like to give is the example of um, an outpatient substance use clinic, right? Maybe methadone. Um, and there are some punitive measures taken for folks whose UDS, whose urine drug screenings are um, testing positive for, for substances, right? Which is a little bit silly, right? Because methadone, uh, it does some things like in our brains and our bodies when it comes to like withdrawal and opioids and our opioid receptors in our brains, right? But um, folks are coming with substance use disorders. They're not going to receive one dose of methadone and never use a drug ever again in their life, right? So um, sometimes uh, a consequence uh, to substance use in a substance use clinic can even be termination, right? Which sounds quite silly um, if that's what folks are coming to receive support for, right? So maybe we beef up services or change something on our, on our end to help like reduce the amount of substances somebody is using if recovery or abstinence is their goal. Um, but we don't want to be terminating them, right? When we're removing people into their homes for the first time who have experienced uh, chronic homelessness, right? Or street homelessness. Um, we don't want to jump to termination when they don't have the daily living skills that we think folks should have when they're living independently, right? We don't want to be terminating folks for things that they're learning and unlearning um, or for the things that they came seeking um, treatment and support for in the first place. Um, everybody knows Brene Brown. There's a cute quote by her right here on the screen um, and says that shame corrodes the very part of us that believes we are capable of change, right? And I think that speaks to this idea of um, the clients that you might think don't want to help themselves, right? Or the participants you think don't want to help themselves. Um, what we know uh, and what Brene Brown says is that because of all the stigma and shame and external stress, um, people really don't believe that they can change, right? So one of the really cool things about being a helping professional is that you get to help walk alongside folks and kind of rebuild that belief in, in oneself, right? And that they can recover and change and um, make progress in whatever way, however they're viewing, um, whatever progress is to them, I think is, is what I'm saying to the client. Okay, and this is a fun one too that most folks probably know, right? Uh, I think we like to say that helping professionals or social workers, maybe specifically love triangles, right? So this is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Maslow is not is not a social worker, um, but we, we love this, right? So one of the things um, I think in the housing first and harm reduction spaces that we are looking to do is meet those physiological needs um, and likely the safety needs also in, in terms of like housing support and like actual physical security. Um, 
so that folks are in a better position to um, accomplish or pursue some other goals if they want to, right? Um, and one of the other things I like to point out about Maslow's hierarchy is like, if this is something we want to take seriously, um, this self-actualization piece and this esteem needs piece is such a small portion of this triangle, right? Um, and sometimes um, when we're not working through a housing first lens or a harm reduction lens, we're flipping this on its on its head, right? We want people to be engaging in therapy um, and in IOP and outpatient groups, and then they're going home to sleep on the street, right? And this kind of doesn't really make sense if we're, if we're taking into consideration uh, the kind of order of our needs. Um, one of the other things I like to point out about this triangle is every other triangle or scale or list that we show is typically something we're typically saying is like, this isn't linear, right? We can jump, we can like float or flow, but that's not the same for Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? That is why it is, this is a hierarchy. So our services, and what we can do, what we hope to do through Housing First Lens is meet those physiological and safety needs um, on the front end. Alrighty, so now some Housing First stuff. What is it? Um, housing First is an evidence-based program model. Um, well, I think we'll talk about some of that evidence. Um, and if we don't, um, there's a 30-year track record of it of it working, right? Putting somebody in a home, um, and guess what? They're no longer homeless. <laughs> um, it also assists individuals experiencing chronic homelessness by living with severe mental illness and or substance use disorder. So these are the folks that we are seeking to house um, because they are traditionally a little harder to house in other programs. Um, through the Housing First model, um, we are offering rental subsidies and permanent housing as quickly as we can. Um, there is a time frame there, but again, that waxes and wanes with uh, uh, like the rental market and housing availability. Um, but there are really no preconditions or barriers. Uh, There's some paperwork to be signed, um, but folks don't have to be committed to any sort of um, treatment um, programs or, or even want to ever stop using substances, right? Which, which I think is something for folks newer to the field is, is harder to hear, right? It's like, when do I have to like, get this person to stop using eventually? Well, the answer is no, right? We want that person to want that for themselves. And we know they're going to be more successful in obtaining that goal if they want that for themselves, right? Another thing that isn't here, but I have picked up from Ryan, um, is that harm reduction is not like a gentle on-ramp, right, to, to recovery. Harm reduction exists outside of recovery or can exist outside of recovery. Um, and I think we fall into this trap of, okay, I'm going to engage with this person through a harm reduction lens until they're ready, right? Somebody doesn't have to ever be ready, I think is the point um, or the model we like to work from or pursue in like the housing first space. Um, but we will have the resources and tools if that is something that they do decide to ultimately pursue for themselves. Um, there's also no predetermined endpoint. Um, the housing first model is designed to support people up to and through the end of their lives. Um, we engage um, with our folks in the beginning um, about end of life care because people die. People who are using substances uh, die also, right? Or are at an increased rate of like uh, premature death, right? Um, and then housing first also op also offers wraparound supports and services to assist individuals in maintaining their housing. Um, so yes, we get them into their homes. We also wanna be um, working to meet other needs that folks are going to have when moving into their homes, um, when they haven't had to use skills or need to learn or use different skills or don't need street or survival skills as much as they did before once they're housed, right? So we're, we're working with folks to learn to unlearn specific behaviors around just what it looks like to live independently um, and what do you need to do to live a fulfilling life and whatever that looks like for you or, or the participant, right? What do you wanna do now? Okay, so there are five key principles of housing first. Um, I'll go through them now. Um, the first is immediate access to permanent housing with no housing readiness requirements. 
one of the things um, that we can do to that maintains like a negative stigma, right? Is this thing called housing readiness, right? Is somebody ready for housing? Well, what does that mean? Um, the director of housing first, his name is Andrew. Uh, if you've ever like had a conversation with him, one of the cool things I've heard him say before is, you don't ask a hungry person if they're food ready, right? You don't ask a starving person if they're food ready, they're hungry, right? So you're going to feed them, right? And the same can be applied to um, homelessness, right? We don't want to ask folks if they're housing ready. We don't need a housing readiness assessment to determine their activities of daily living skills and their abilities to maintain their home, right? That is a point of the wraparound services that we're going to provide once they're housed. Um, participant choice and self-determination are going to be crucial here. Um, we want folks to be as involved in the process as they can, um, because we know that that increases the chances of just successful outcomes, right? Of people staying in their units or staying in their units longer, um, maybe getting in engage in some community supports. Um, and we also, uh, the third principle is multiple pathways of recovery orientation. Now, I love harm reduction. I love to talk about it. That doesn't mean I'm not capable or not willing of talking about um, recovery oriented services for folks who do want that for themselves, right? Um, I don't think harm reduction, like a harm reduction lens is saying like, I love that people use substances right or use drugs and have an addiction um but i think it's saying like i think folks who do not want to change this right now or don't see this as a problem in their own lives like are going to be resistant to putting them in a detox program right that doesn't make much sense for somebody um so we want to honor that some folks will and some folks won't want to engage in recovery oriented services and that that is okay um, individualized and participant-driven supports are also going to be super important. I think when we feel um, kind of like at a loss for our work with a client or, or we struggle to see any progress. And um, when I worked at Pathways, I used to do technical assistance, like sort of sessions with folks. And I think this was the space that many kind of organizations existed in and would ask us for support with. And just like, I don't feel like I'm doing anything with this participant or what can I do to get them engaged, right? And I, and I think that really starts with like taking a step back and asking, right? Engaging with that participant directly, say, hey, maybe it doesn't look like I'm doing anything. Or even as the clinician or the helping professional, I think it's perfectly okay to be like, I don't feel like I'm helping you right now. Is there anything I can be doing? Or what would you like to work on in the context of our program, right? Um, one of the other things I could talk about here is like when it comes to treatment planning, right? Um, many treatment planning systems um, and templates are pre-filled or have pre-filled options. And that is a, um, should be an alarm bell for uh, treatment and recovery and program goals not being individualized or participant driven, right? We can loop them in and collaborate probably more than we think in, in treatment planning and goals for um, programming. And then social and community inclusion. Um, Andrew, the director, also likes to say we like to get people inside, but then we also like to get them out, right, and engage in the community and doing some fun things, fulfilling things to them um, when, once they're housed. We want to get them as involved in the community as possible. Any questions or comments here, feel free to go ahead and shoot them in the chat. I, I'm, I've said a lot so far. All right. And now we have a kind of quick comparison of um, LRT, this stands for Linear Residential Treatment Model and Housing First. Um, so Linear Residential Treatment Model is going to, if you think back to the Maslow Hierarchy of Needs slide, um, we're taking that triangle and we're flipping it on its head, right? We want people to make all these clinical, all this clinical progress and goals and achievements first, and then we want to house them, right? It is mostly merit-based. Um, and based on clinical assumptions about what clients are and are not capable of. Um, it's also based on the assumption that providers know best about what is going to serve a client. Um, in, in linear residential treatment models, clients must demonstrate desirable behaviors to earn housing, right? That is that housing readiness piece. Um, and clients with severe mental illness require um, or can require around the clock staff supervision. Um, which we know can also perpetuate and increase uh, the stigma and the internalized kind of just negative feelings folks have about um, the conditions or the experiences that they live with. Um, clients typically don't have uh, much say in their housing trajectory. 
um, and maybe we have this unit available, you have to move in, right? One of the things I didn't mention uh, about housing first in um, kind of participant choice and self-determination is we want folks to have some say in, in where they're living, right? If you want to live here because it's close to family, great. We want to find a unit in that area. If you want to live as far away from your family as possible, that's something we want to support um, also. Um, and then housing for linear residential group models typically depends on availability. That may be a similarity between the two, um, unless housing first programs have their own uh, kind of like housing structures and buildings. Uh, housing first is a evidence-based practice. We've talked about that. Um, the client is the expert, is the undisputed expert on their experience. And we should be checking with them about that on a pretty consistent basis. Um, the housing first model operates through a lens where we believe housing um, is a human right. Um, provides clients with a high level of support in the community so they can be successful independently. Um, because the goal, the goal is independence, right? Folks don't want case managers forever, believe it or not, right? Folks don't want people knocking on our door for random home visits. Folks don't want that. And I'm not going to say there aren't folks who don't love your company because that is true too. There are going to be those clients who like are just waiting for you with a cup of tea for their home visit because they love that and maybe don't have a lot of social supports yet, which can be another goal. Um, but yeah, it, it might not be the norm for folks to want case management forever. Um, choices are going to be also really important. We know that our folks become better at making choices by having choices to make, right? That practice piece. Um, and then move the move in and relocation for folks is much quicker uh, due to use of open market, uh, open market rentals. So um, we hope to be able to move folks in and around units um, because we are acquiring those units through maybe master leasing. Um, I see a question in the chat. If there's no goal or assumption in housing first that people will eventually get to self-actualization, what is the definition of success? Thanks um, for asking this and putting this here. And I, I think it's a great question um, to get our minds thinking about housing first. Um, if we think back to the key principles of housing first, which actually is just one slide back, so I'll take us back a slide. Um, when we think about success, uh, I think the principles we want to think we want to be like reflecting on is participant choice and self determination, um, and the individualized and participant driven supports. Right. So the linear residential treatment model that we talked about as not being very evidence based emphasizes that the clinician, us, you, know best what is what your client should be be engaging in to live a healthier life. Right. Um, the housing first model emphasizes the idea that participant choice and self-determination is going to probably be the most important measure in engaging success for somebody. Um, success for our participants is not going to look the same as success for us or what we believe that to be. Can I add uh, just a, a bit there? I, I love this question and I love Kahlo's answer. And, and I'll just add that I don't think we, we don't have the goal of self-actualization for folks in a housing first context. We do, but... I think self-actualization really should be self-defined. Like what, what do I want my life to look like, right? What, what does self-actualization look like? And I think if we walk in with the assumption that um, abstinence from risky behavior equals self-actualization, then that's going to be our goal, but not the participants, right? So self-actual, to me, self-actualization, I think can include um, risky behaviors as well, right? So I, I think about my own health and my own life and um, certainly I'm not doing all of the things that my doctor wants me to do, let's say for my physical health, right? Um, there are, th there are ways that I could continue to improve my health. There are some things that I'm like, I'm never going to do that, right? Like I'm never going to put down that bag of Doritos because I just love it so much is my like silly example. But I think I can still achieve a level of self-actualization with those risky behaviors too. And so I think I just want to kind of separate this idea that like self-actualization equals abstinence. Um, and that, but I, but I think in your question, I read a really good point, which is that like, yes, we do want people to achieve the highest levels of, of self-actualization. We just want to make sure that they have all of that foundational stuff there too first, right? Um, because we, we understand that it's so much harder to 
achieve our best selves without a roof over our head, or over our head, without um, warm food in our bellies, um, you know, without that sense of belongingness, etc. Um, I saw Ashley uh, Martin. It looked like you were kind of a mutant. Did, did you want to add a, a little bit there? Or maybe you were just playing with the mic a little bit. Um, yeah, let's pause there. This is a good point point to pause. Do we want do, do other folks have kind of questions, comments, thoughts, um, other things you're thinking about here? Okay, Sonia says, thank you. That's helpful. Great. I love it. All right. Let me move us forward then. Um, thanks, Kahlo, for for all that like recap. Um again, happy to kind of come back to some of this stuff. Oh, I see somebody unmuting on the on the phone. Hit us. Maybe not. Okay, here we go. Um, so I wanna get us into some of the clinical skills that we're specifically using in this housing first context, right? Um, and I wanna really emphasize that all of that choice and self-determination that Kahlo talks so much about um, sounds really beautiful and also Ooh. makes life pretty hard, right? It makes providing services pretty hard. Um, thinking even like the housing market that that we referenced, right? Yes, we want to be able to offer folks even choice in like the section of the city that they live in, right? Um, do I want to still live in Kensington where all like the where all the drugs have been um, accessible to me? Or do I want to move myself far from that so I can distance myself from those things? That's even a choice that in, in a discussion that we're having with folks. Um, and in that, it's not going to be the easiest path, right? It's not it's it's not the um, simplest path to say, where do you want to live? Oh my gosh, the housing market is so tough. How am I going to get you in that neighborhood that you want to live in? Um, so I think it's kind of facilitating that high level of choice and self-determination is a difficult task. Uh, and we want to make sure we're bringing sort of all of our tools, right? Like our full tool belt to that project. Um, and so here are some of the clinical skills. I'll start by outlining um, a set of principles that we use in harm reduction. Um, I think because harm reduction can be such a creative process, um, it can look so different because it's so kind of individualized and participant centered. Um, I think for me, it can feel overwhelming. Like, what do I do with this person? Like, what, what's my goal? <laughs> what interventions am I gonna use? And the more we talk about harm reduction interventions, it becomes clear that like, there's no one thing that is harm reduction, like no one set of interventions. Uh, it's as creative as we can be to move in the direction of safety and bodily autonomy, right? As our two main goals. Uh, and so how do we know that the thing that we're proposing to do with this person fits in this kind of bucket of harm reduction? And I think these principles give us something that we can kind of hang our hat on and say, you know what? I'm, I'm really hitting a lot of these principles. I think I'm doing harm reduction. I think this feels right. I think I'm um, kind of meeting the client where they are. Um, so. I'll kind of walk through these. Um, the first principle is health and dignity. Uh, we see this principle through kind of a, the more commonly understood harm reduction interventions like syringe exchanges, right? Uh, very, very much a individual intervention as well as a public health intervention, right? Kind of very focused on health. Um, but also there's a dignity to this, to this, right? Where, where we're caring for people and respecting people as individuals um, we understand that people are doing the things that they're doing, making the choices that they're making for a reason. Um, I, even, I may not be able to understand that reason. I, I think of this, um, this really tough example, um, you know, in the opioid supply, more and more, we're seeing, um, the spread of something called Trank, which is literally a horse tranquilizer. Um, that is that is finding its way into the opioid supply, right? Uh, and they do it because it sort of extends the high, um, kind of hits differently, and has a really damaging and significant effect on people's skin, right, and bodies. And so um, even I was just talking to uh, a colleague yesterday talking about how difficult it was to see so many people, very young people um, with amputated limbs, right, as a result of injecting um, a lot of this trank. And 
you know, it raises the question, you know, your arm starts to look a certain way, feel a certain way, and you're still injecting into it, right? I may not really be able to understand that. But I have to believe that there is a legitimate reason that, that you're sort of like accessing a set of options that you feel like you have on the table and you're choosing the best option available. Um, often in that case, uh, as I've heard Kahlo talk about, um, the kind of most immediate pain relief for some of that is to inject into that spot again, right? Uh, that is going to be like the most immediate short-term benefit, right? And so I may not be able to sort of understand that, but the dignity of saying, you know what, I think you're doing what you're doing for a legitimate reason, even if I can't understand it. Um, we're also um, affording the dignity of kind of helping people understand the balance between benefits and harms. Yeah, the 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 thing that you're doing does have some harms associated with it. But there, but I have to believe that there are also benefits. And so it's worth having that discussion. Let's talk about both the pros and the cons here, right? Uh, we're taking a more measured kind of middle of the road view around this stuff um, and around people's health uh, and their dignity as well. Uh, the next principle is participant-centered. Uh, now I've been practicing social work for a long time now and um, never have I ever heard somebody in a training or in a, in, a, in a classroom setting or in supervision say that they're not participant-centered, right? And so this is not a novel concept, right? Participant-centered is like pretty core to the, to the helping professions. I think harm reduction really does take this to another level, right? And so that's why it's here, um, where we're really centering the therapeutic relationship. If a thing that you're going to do is going to harm the therapeutic relationship, it's worth evaluating. Do I make that decision, right? Is it worth it to do that? Um, there are certain boundaries that we must keep, uh, especially when we're thinking about safety, um, or especially as we're thinking about the kind of helping relationship in those boundaries, but we're really trying to center the therapeutic relationship at every step of the way. Um, and so, you know, as part of this, we're acknowledging that people have their own strengths and their own needs, and it's going to require individualized, uh, intervention strategies, it, this, a harm reduction in a housing first context is not going to look the same for any two people, right? It's going to look very different, probably. Um, maybe this person needs to have their stove shut off and they need a hot plate. But this other person with many of the same behaviors is cool to have the stove, but we check on them every third day, right? We, we, we check on them and have phone calls with them about their cooking practices. A, a, a pretty common example of, of folks who... Um, maybe get lost in, in their thoughts, or uh, maybe they're having mental health symptoms and they're not turning the stove off. That's a real big risk, right? That's a that's a fire risk. It's also um, a property damage risk. Um, so, so kind of the approach is not going to look the same for any two people. Uh, and so we're really centering the participant and, and, and their strengths and needs. Participant involvement is another principle of harm reduction. Um, we are not doing harm reduction to people, right? We're not like, hey, I'm performing harm reduction intervention with you. Um, we are actively and from the jump um, using strategies like shared decision-making uh, and, and, and really strongly informed consent to involve participants in their care. Hey, I know that you want to live in Kensington still. Um, I want to let you know we have apartments in other places. We also have an apartment in Kensington. Um, it could look like you being pretty close to those folks, those drug dealers that you had some problems with before. Um, wh what might that look like? How might you navigate that? Is that something you're interested in? Um, here's the support we can provide. What do you think? Right? Like it, it's, it's their decision. And so kind of involving them in that process at every step of the way, weighing the pros and cons is one way that we um, really emphasize this participant involvement. Um, even to the point of, you know, having participants participate in case consultations, right? We're all familiar with the idea of like getting with our treatment team, uh, maybe pull in the psychiatrist and the primary care, care, care physician and, 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 and really saying like, there's problematic stuff happening. What do we do for this person? What if that person was in the room with all of those folks, right? And, and it felt more like a collaborative team instead of a tribunal where we're like casting um, uh, judgments upon this person, right? And then the next layer to that, the next step of that is, is true participant self-rule. Um, so people are going to make the choices that they're going to make. They're individuals, they're adults. Um, we can offer suggestions. We can offer education. We can offer options. Sometimes 
choices become limited, right? I think about folks who um, who have been evicted like several times from apartments for like the same behaviors over and over again. Um, at some point, their choices do become limited. And, and no, we can't protect them from every single sort of natural consequence that may occur. Um, but but ultimately, we want folks to be able to make the choices for themselves. I think back to Sonia's question of self-actualization, the opportunity to make choices, the opportunity to sometimes um, make mistakes, but then try again, is is really what we're getting at with, with the choice and self-determination piece here with the participant self-rule. Um, the way that we learn, especially if we are a person who has not been like housed consistently, the way that we develop that skill set is by trying, right? And so giving people kind of the space to make their decisions on their own is what we're talking about here. The next one uh, that we wanted to kind of hit on is the recognition of inequalities and injustices. Um, there are realities of uh, lived experience that people have uh, in our in our settings of poverty that they've lived with, of classism, of racism, perhaps of social isolation, perhaps past trauma that they've experienced, maybe sex-based discrimination, many other social inequalities that people um, have been on the receiving end of. These things affect people's vulnerability to harm, right? Some A, a person of relatively more privilege is going to be less vulnerable to a given harm, right? And so two people engaging in risky behavior, there's going to be a differential effect on how they experience uh, potential harms of that behavior, right? Uh, and so that often comes down to these inequalities and injustices. Um, and so when we talk about equity, we're talking about sort of supporting people as they need to be supported and keeping in mind what they've lived with, what they've been through, what traumas they've experienced, Um Kahlo has really eloquently talked about um, serving Black trans women on uh, his clinical team and, and maybe suggesting that the service coordinators go and do additional home visits for this person, right? That's additional support. And I think you could read that as saying, wait a minute, you're, you're going, you're, you're doing favoritism for that person. The reality is maybe that's a recognition of kind of injustice that that person has faced or that identity group has faced and a recognition of um, the increased harm that that pe person may be exposed to as a result of their identity. Uh, and, and I think that is fair and um, important to do. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. Uh, we're getting into my two favorite principles. Um, I love this principle here, practical and realistic. In an ideal world, a participant would kind of hear our suggestions take up those suggestions and move in the direction of greater health in a very smooth and easy way. Uh, the reality is that some of our suggestions will fit better for some people or it'll just hit them in, in a different way, right? They'll be more open to those suggestions, right? The truth is that we as individuals may never achieve perfect health behaviors. I gave the example earlier of the Doritos. I'm never going to achieve perfect health behaviors. There is a benefit to some of the risks that I take in my life, right? That is valuable to me. And the same for our participants. However, any positive change that kind of puts people in a direction of better health, better wellness, but also supporting their bodily autonomy is worth celebrating. What is this person going to do? No, they're not going to stop using uh, fentanyl. But if we can help them reduce by two bags a day, that is progress. That is something worth celebrating. Um, and I think we have to see that as a, as a success, right? Because we're submitting to this principle of what's practical and realistic for this person. Is it realistic that they're just going to go cold turkey? Probably not. Uh, but it might be realistic that they can reduce by two bags a day um, so that they're not injecting into that spot so frequently. And the final one that I think really kind of connects harm reduction with housing first, right? These are different sort of interventions. They overlap, they support one another. This one I think really is the pivot point. Accountability without termination, right? And, and Khalil talked about this when he talked about a stressful term, stressful events, but not ending our relationship with folks. This is the idea that participants are not fired from services for not meeting their goals, 
there's a reason they're in your program. There's a reason, there's a reason they need permanent supportive housing, right? Uh, and so let's say they've made really great progress around their risk behaviors, but then they move back in the other direction. That's not a reason to terminate people. And I think often we'll see things like, um, oh, you're using again. Um, this is your first warning. If we see it three times, we may have to stop services, right? That would be an example of like firing people for not meeting their goals. Um, in a housing first context, we're continuing to help people, yes, to understand the consequences of their behaviors. Hey, every time you pick back up again, I notice that um, there's heavy traffic in your apartment. The parties start getting louder. We start getting a lot of calls from landlords and neighbors, right? And so that's putting you at risk of eviction, right? And so we're trying to help people understand those consequences um, and the potential consequence of them losing their, their housing again and to own the responsibility for, for their choices, but to do so in a way that we're not sort of pulling the rug out from people. Uh, we continue to support them without terminating them. Whew, I've been talking for a while. Let me pause there. What questions, what comments, what reactions are, are folks having right now? Are you still with me? Good morning. Um, this is Valerie Bradshaw. I'm listening to you speak about the accountability without termination. Um, I think is a very critical component that um, sometimes when you're dealing with a larger number of people and you're trying to triage and fast track at the same time, you find yourself in a position where if it's wait lists and things like that involved, without actually realizing it, termination happens without gauging in the accountability piece to try and keep people in the program. And that, will we get this information when you're done? Will we get copies of this PowerPoint and everything? Because it, it's critical to, um, maybe better understand some of the tools to consider, especially if it's somebody that's using. You wanna keep staff safe, you wanna keep everybody safe. And at the same time, you're still trying to help the individual. So yeah, mm -hmm. you go ahead. Yeah, thanks for your your comments, Valerie. I, I really appreciate that. And I can tell that you're really kind of operating from, you're like critically thinking about like your own setting and like, how does this apply? Where are we, where can we better support folks? So I really appreciate hearing Hearing that, uh, the answer is yes, you are going to get a copy of these slides, uh, as well as some tip sheets around some of the tools that we um, are going to present. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we'll also make a recording of, of the training available to the Housing Alliance, and I, and I think uh, they have ways that they um, uh, forward some of that material to you as well. Um, yeah, I, I just want to acknowledge and like validate that our, our own resource constraints get in the way of doing the ideal housing first and harm reduction practice, right? Like, especially when you're talking about um, waiting lists, right? This person has lost three straight apartments and um, and we've got, you know, a bunch of people on a waiting list. They're not making any changes. I've got somebody who's ready to be housed. Um, how do you weigh that? And I think that's so challenging, but I think you're right, Valerie. You're, I think what you're speaking to is um, making sure that if they're gonna, if if we're gonna like move somebody to the back of the line or something like that, right? If for for lack of a better word, are we making sure that we have these conversations around consequences, around responsibility and accountability, right? Instead of just sort of like operating as this powerful force that is gatekeeping resources, and I'm sorry, you're on the back of the line now, right? That's too many times. How can we help people and and, and take the time and the energy to help people understand the chain of events that led us here? And, and where do we see room for growth and change? Uh, that's the accountability piece that we're talking about. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know that uh, I heard like a very specific question, but I think you're just speaking to some of the challenges with this and, and some of the need for um, accessing these tools. So I see another comment in the chat from Rachel. With regards to accountability without termination, can you talk about the difference between behavior that might warrant termination and behavior that there are other ways to deal with accountability? It's a great question, uh, Rachel. On our end, um, I know not everybody is operating with the same sort of set of resources, et cetera, as Pathways is, but there are very few things that lead to directly determination. 
Um, and we try and sort of build in um, many kind of safety nets, I guess I want to call it, right? So, so here's one at like kind of the far end of it. Um, when people have put their own housing in jeopardy many, many times, um, and we're not able to rehouse them right away again for the manyth time, um, what, what sometimes happens is that people get put on service only at Pathways, right? And so we're not able to get them back into an apartment right now, but we still have the ACT team, the, the case management interprofessional team that we're wrapping around that, that person, right? So we're still providing something, some level of services, support, resources, even if the housing is not present right now, right? Uh, and so I use that as an example to kind of like um, create just additional levels of support so that we don't arrive at a place where we're terminating people. Um, you know, one 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 thing that might lead to termination uh, or at least a temporary termination might be somebody is incarcerated long-term, right? We we really try and push that boundary. They say that that we're not supposed to keep keep them in their housing housing after like 90 days if they're incarcerated. And we're like really working with the criminal legal system to make sure that we can um, keep them there so that they have a place to come back to if if they're going to get uh, released in, in some reasonable time frame. Um, so that might be a place, a space where there's some termination. Um, Kahlo, are there other kind of specific things that you can think of that are really termination specific uh, in our context? Yeah, and I, I think looping in the harm reduction piece might be helpful. We talk a lot about um, like autonomy, right, and choice. And one of the things that we have been in discussion with with other groups is that uh, we draw a line when you are encroaching on somebody else's autonomy um, and ability to choose um, for themselves. So um, by that, I mean like if somebody is like physically harming somebody else, and I will say that's at pathways it's not always a a hard like okay no more but that's when we are talking more about like the possibility of termination is when somebody is harming other people or impacting their kind of um functioning in everyday life yeah i think to, to add to that like a sometimes we have these conversations rachel and people are like tell us what are the tell us what are the circumstances where you're gonna terminate somebody and one of the things that we hold to be uh, really important in housing first context uh, is that there is no like hard and fast rule around that. This person may be terminated for this behavior and their history of behaviors, et cetera, and somebody else may not be. We don't want to sort of like prescribe very specific things, except like what Kahlo is talking about, right? Like harming a staff member or harming a um another participant or maybe like a significant threat of one of those harms um we've we've seen that in the past around termination but we really want to like extend the support provide layers of, of additional step downs if we can uh, etc thank you you're welcome thanks for your question um I okay one oh yes please let me go back Okay. I heard somebody go, hit us. Hi, this is LaDonna. Um, I know we are targeting the um, the participant, but how do you help the case manager or the person that's on it um, also with following through with the accountability without termination? So, for example, um, say that you have a client, you've helped them, like they've been 20 years. And you and you are continuously doing what you're saying about the accountability without termination. How do we stay in the game and still be, um, you know, because uh, there's an emotional attachment if you've been with them that long, right? If they've been in the system in and out, and you and you have honestly exhausted all the options that you have within the state, and you still care for the person, you still want something. How do we deal with our emotions with that when we really don't have still keeping them without terminate um without terminating them, but how do we still keep our emotions in check even though we, we we don't have any I don't know what else to do? How do we help them when we don't when the uh we've exhausted everything? How do we still show up for them without um 
you know, without being, you know, too emotional. And I guess you can't help that if you've been with them a long time. So I'm, I'm struggling with that. Like I, I want to help somebody and we've gone through everything and we still back at square one and I'm not giving up on them, but I don't know what else to do when there's nothing else left. I've, I've begged and, and done everything with everybody. But how do I still give them from an empty cup? I, I guess that's my question. Yeah, I, um, I'm going to let Kahlo, Kahlo speak because I see Kahlo like reacting to this. Go ahead. Yeah, I think of a few things, LaDonna. One of the things I think about uh, are terms you might be familiar with, like compassion fatigue and burnout with folks, um, which requires a whole set of new strategies and like self introspection and, and exploration, uh, which is another training for another day. But um, I also want to make clear that that frustration that you experience uh, like is not, I think what can be helpful is like directing that frustration and energy like outward, external, maybe towards the agency. And we can advocate for some additional resources we can be like providing because like what I hear you saying is like, I've done everything I can for this participant. And that can be true, right? But you've done everything you can for that participant in the context of your job role and your agency, right? There are other things that can be done for this participant, right? But we're not able to provide them because of our role or our agency's resources, right? And I think that is a lot of times channeled to the participant. It's like, I've done everything I can for you and I can't do anything else. But really, we've done what we can in like the context of our job, which makes a lot of sense. That's what we can do. That is the degree to which we can help and support folks. Um, and I, I guess what I'm saying is like just like a quick reframe, like in and with ourselves about just like the care that we're providing is like sometimes what our agencies can provide just isn't enough for our folks, um, which I think is is hard to hear because we we want to be heroes and we want to support folks and get them through all the stuff they come to us with, but it, it's um, might not be a one person or one agency job. I think is what I'm saying. I don't know if that's very clear. Um, yeah, I think as as much of your own kind of social supports or maybe even advocating for that in your own workspace and like what does keep you energized and what does keep you going or will keep you going and supporting your folks the best you can is a good conversation to start um, at your workplace or maybe with some folks who like are also thinking some similar things. Um, but yeah, it's important. I, I love the self-awareness piece because it's important that you can recognize that. That's not the energy that folks come into the helping profession with, right? Um, so that is like an immediate sign that like, okay, I need to do something for myself, right? But I also understand that the actual question is like, what do I do for myself? So I apologize. I don't have like a, a concrete answer there. Can I no, I'll give no a problem. concrete answer? Was... Oh, go ahead, Ladon. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say it's... it's um... It's, it's just open for discussion because um, it's not frustration. It's just like, um, you know, I've I've done the collaborate with other agencies and stuff like that. I've done my personal prayer and, you know, because I'm not giving up on a person. It's just because the person, you know, sometimes we have people that have been in the system a long time. Maybe the system have given up on them, right? And, and if I do anything privately for them you know you can get you can get reprimanded for that right you, they tell you don't do that part you know you still believe in them and they just need a little bit a little bit of something else and you, you still motivate them you still send them stuff you still make sure they're comfortable um but i'm just limited by what the resources like you said my environment can give to the person because we probably exhausted everything and and that's and that's a recent one and i'm just I'm chuggling with my heart with that. Not it's not burnout. It's just I don't what's I don't have I don't know any other steps. I should say that. Should I create a step? Should I write a grant? Should I, I you know all those things? I'm just I'm still forging forward, but I don't know what else to do. I, and everybody else says I'm done because he been that the person might have been in the system a very long time. But I don't know what else to do because I'm new with it. So it's like, okay, I still don't give up on the person. So it was just to foster communication. Maybe I could hear something that somebody else have done. Um, but that's all it is. Um, that's it. That's that's awesome, Donna. Thank you for sharing that. 
Um, I'm just seeing um, other comments in the chat. I see Keisha, um, I think, correctly identifying the idea of like secondary trauma and self-care. Um, uh, Tony kind of asking about how do we communicate this and, and these principles to larger systems, which I think maybe does kind of touch on LaDonna's Lod mm -hmm. points, right? Like, hey, everybody's given up on this person. I see a systemic problem. I see a gap. And, 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 and like, how do we solve that gap? Um, Brittany, when you do all you can, there's not much else. Um, yeah. And Kahlo just noting like, yeah, you don't, you don't have to give up even if, even if like sort of the systems around you are saying maybe it's time to give up. That's okay. You don't have to, right? Um, I will say really, really in, in, in really brief terms, we do have a vicarious trauma training. Uh, and one of the things I want to say is um, the, my biggest point that we make in that training is vicarious trauma is an occupational hazard of the work. You will experience vicarious trauma in this work. Uh, and that's not a moral failing on your part. It is a, it's the fact that you are bringing empathy to the table and will become overwhelmed at some point uh, and, and experience a shift in your worldview. Um, and one of the things, one of the key strategies that we use is meaning making, right? How do I make meaning out of this situation? Um, and so I, in this case, I think, has this person, you know, I, I, this is a rhetorical question, LaDonna, because I want us to move on a little bit, but um, has this person been housed longer than they haven't been housed, right? They've been in your services for a long time. Maybe they're in and out of housing. Um, but in the kind of grand sum, they've been housed longer than they've been unhoused. I think that's a success. Um, you know, you're keeping somebody from being unhoused and on the street and living that rough. Um, and so I, to me, that's like one, one example of like connecting to the meaning making of the work. No, this person's, this person hasn't achieved that self-actualization that we want to see for them, but here are some harms that we've mitigated along the way. And I think that's worth like celebrating and tapping into a little bit. Um, okay. Let me move us on. Uh, and maybe we can return to some of these questions closer to the end. Um, just being cognizant of the time. I want us to have plenty of time to talk like case studies too. Um, so here is the kind of second tool that we wanted to bring to your attention. Uh, it's called the continuum of use. And it's an inclusive spectrum that covers kind of managed use all the way up through total abstinence for people. Um, and you'll hear in our discussion of this that we're really pretty clearly talking about drugs uh, and drugs and alcohol. But I want us to think more broadly than that, thinking about risk, right? What are risky behaviors that people engage in? Um, Yes, it might include drugs. Maybe it includes sex work. Uh, maybe it includes um, choosing not to take mental health medication or access uh, medical care. These are examples of risky behaviors that we like to ex expand the idea of harm reduction to include, right? Uh, and so kind of walking through this, we can see that people use drugs, engage in risky behaviors for different reasons. And it, it exists on a spectrum, right? Uh, so for example, social and ritual use, maybe a person only um, drinks a little bit when they're with their friends or smokes a little weed when they're like hanging out and watching movies with somebody, right? Um, perhaps um, people start to get experimental, right? Mm, I never tried X, Y, and Z drug. Let me try that. Uh, let me see what that feels like. Let me see how it affects me. Um, we've also, we also see people that binge use. I think this is very common among people with full-time jobs, right? I make sure that I don't do X, Y, and Z risky behavior during the week, but on the weekend I let, I let loose, right? It would be an example of binge, of binge use. Um, another, um, step on this continuum is situational use, right? So only when I'm hanging out with that person do I use, or only when I'm, um, have to go to like these. Fam boring family gatherings will I use or only when I have to go to work will I make sure that I intake caffeine, <laughs> right? Uh, so very situational in that sense. Uh, we also kind of step up towards like um, what we might start to call abuse, although we really prefer to use the term substance use instead of substance abuse. Um, but you see more habitual and chronic use, right? A regular part of people's lives uh, in a consistent way. And then finally, the kind of highest end of this spectrum would be um, severe, persistent, chemically dependent use, right? Um, what we have to understand is that people use drugs for different reasons. Um, and, you know, people's relationship to drugs and to risky behavior does change over time, right? So this is not like, 
you know, this one person uh, seems to be a really heavy binger and it puts their housing at risk frequently. Their relationship to that drug or that, or that risky behavior may change over time. This is what we're seeing now, but that's not like a static fixed in time thing that they're with, right? And so we can help people assess where they're at on the continuum. Is this where you want to be? Do you foresee any change? Would you like to have any change along this, right? And so we can we can use this tool to help people acknowledge um, some nuance. And I think we get caught, especially when we're in like abstinence only type settings, caught between this idea of you're either using or you're not. Uh, and so this continuum helps us to understand people's reasons for use and like, what does it actually look like and how's it playing out in your life? And when we can bring that level of nuance we can, and we can access people's reasons, we can help them develop some motivation to changing, right? Um, your situational use seems to be problematic. It's causing X, Y, and Z problems. How do we alter the situation? How do we alter your response to those situations? Is that something you even want, right? Um, so yeah, obviously there are some ways of using drugs and engaging in risk behavior that are safer than others. And we wanna help people access some of that. Um, so. One way that you can use a tool like this um, is to, you know, talk about it a little bit removed from the person, especially if they're in pre-contemplation or contemplation stage of change uh, and suggest to them like, hey, you know, who's a person that you like really care about very deeply? Where would you place them on this continuum, right? Like how much are they using? What does it look like? Let's get nuanced about it. Let's break it down. Interesting. What about somebody who you... Um, really look up to, or somebody that you love and care about, where do they fall in the continuum of use? What about you? Where do you fall on this continuum? Okay, is that where you want to be, right? We're kind of like drawing out more information, evoking um, people's motivations and um, helping them understand where they're at themselves and helping them decide where they want to be. Uh, so the continuum of use is a, is a really great tool uh, for some of that. Our next tool that we wanted to um, put in front of you is something called the Honest Budget. And um, we'll include a copy of the Honest Budget in, in our follow-up materials. But the Honest Budget is, is much like any budget, right? It's a way to kind of realistically plan for monthly expenditures. And we do see in a housing first context, um, money being a pretty big trigger for crisis, um, but also a... a um, a space where people put their own housing at risk around money, right? Like being able to pay their rent or being able to have enough money, or excuse me, um, uh, food in the fridge, uh, you know, enough money to do groceries. And that sort of conflicts sometimes with the way that they're spending their money. Are they using all their money on dope and, and, and not having enough to pay their rent? That's causing you, a, that's a housing tendency issue. And in order to prevent the ultimate harm from our perspective of somebody arriving back on the street, uh, we wanna make sure that they're, that they're kind of clear eye, in a clear eyed way, looking at where their money is actually going. Um, and so what the honest budget does is it helps people inventory all the ways that they make and spend their money. And, and sometimes this includes like what we might call like more unsavory things, right? We want this to be a space of pure honesty, right? Uh, and, and because of that, it tends to promote the choice and self-determination that we've talked so much about um, and be very participant-centered. Uh, and so when we're engaging in this intervention, uh, we're hopefully allowing people to make really informed decisions about their money. If they don't change anything about the way that they're spending money, there are probably going to be some natural consequences that we're not going to be able to protect them from. Uh, but this is one tool that we can use to um, hopefully allow them to, to think more um, broadly about their money. So I'll show you what it looks like. Uh, I know this is probably kind of small, but on the left side, you see just the kind of blank template. And on the right side, you see an example of like a filled out one. Um, I love it. I love it so much. You see things like child support show up, um, spending money on girlfriends, boyfriends, partners, uh, household supplies, partying shows up as a, as a line item on here. Um, sex shows up as a line item on here. Gambling, legal issues and fines that people have to pay shows up as a line item, uh, right? So, and you can see that like we're really 
trying very hard to expand what a, what a typical budget looks like. We know that people are making choices out there that are maybe jeopardizing their own safety, their own well-being, their own housing tenancy. Let's be honest about that. Without judgment, we can approach this conversation and say, okay, I get it. You're spending like 80% of your money on sex. Let's put that on there so that we can like evaluate whether that's where you want to be. Um, and then on the right side, so that was all the ways that I'm spending money. On the right side, we put all the ways that I get money. And we know people do all kinds of wild stuff to get money uh, to support themselves. Uh, so people do binning and bottle collecting, odd jobs, treasure hunting, uh, babysitting, maybe drug running and dealing could show up on here. Um, maybe theft and pawning is a consistent way that people are making money. I'd like that to show up there. No, I don't love that you're engaging in theft and pawning because I think it's going to um, probably catch up to you at some point and you're going to be faced with worse consequences. But let's talk about that, at least openly. Uh, we, we don't want it to be sort of a secret. I think when people are hiding their behavior, then they are less likely to be safe, right? When people are hiding, they're alone, they're not accessing support, they're not accessing community, and they're likely to be to, to sort of like ramp up the level of risk of that given behavior. Uh, so this is a way to kind of shine a light on some of that. Um, great. Here's the next tool we wanted to talk about. Um, if you're familiar with motivational interviewing, this might be a familiar tool. Uh, it comes from, from motivational interviewing um, and motivational interviewing shows up throughout the practice of housing first. Um, in our harm reduction practice, we're weaving it in. Uh, we're weaving it in in engagement, in goal setting, in risk behaviors. We're using a ton of motivational interviewing. It's, it's a core part of the, of the model. Um, but in particular, the readiness ruler is a really helpful tool to support people's choices, right? To support uh, goal setting, um, to support examining risk. Uh, and so what we do with this ruler is we kind of ask a series of questions, right? We ask people to self-identify a given risk behavior. How important is it for you to change that behavior on a one to 10 scale, right? And so that's the ruler component. Well, I think it's a, a three. I hear somebody say there are three on the readiness ruler of importance for change. That's not a very high number, but it's not a two and it's not a one. Why is it a, as a three and why is it not a two? Oh, uh, well, I experienced this consequence this one time and I don't want to experience that again, but it's not that big of a deal. That's useful information to kind of talk about, to examine priorities, to examine motivations, to examine... Um, yeah, again, how, how do people prioritize given changes in their life? The next question we can ask is how ready do you think you are that you can make this change today, right? If somebody thinks it's important to make a given change. Let's take it that next step. Okay, you're at like a nine on this, right? You're a nine on moving down two bags a day of fentanyl. How ready do you think you are to make that change? Uh, well, I need to make sure that like I'm, I've got my money lined up correctly and... I need, I need to make sure that like the people that I use with know that I'm cutting back so they don't try and pressure me. Uh, but I think I'm like a five on the readiness scale. Okay, what would it take to, to inch that readiness up from a five to a six? Yeah, I think I need some help talking to my friends. Okay, let's role play, right? Like it opens up so many additional layers of conversation uh, when we can help people bring out their own interests, their own motivations for possible change and express that desire through their own words. Uh, and then finally, how confident are you that you can make this change? Somebody may think um, some harm reduction strategy that you've talked about is super important. They're a nine and they feel so ready. They're a nine, but I'm only a two on the confidence scale. To me, I'm hearing that they're identifying some barriers, right? They're ready, they're willing, but they don't feel able. Uh, and so we can help provide the tools to help them become able to make the change that they want in their lives. Not some change that I'm pushing on them, but something that they've self-identified. Um, so we can use this tool to examine ambivalence towards change. Uh, we can start to plan the process. We can strengthen any change talk that we hear um, and just like strengthen their overall commitment to a possible change. Uh, I'll pause there. Are there any questions so far about the continuum of use, the readiness ruler, the honest budget? Um, 
I see there's some good discussion happening in the chat about LaDonna's comments. Um, yeah, some good stuff there. Cool. All right, let me bring us to our next tool. Um, our next tool is safety-based goal setting. Um, in the context of harm reduction, we want to help people identify potential harms in the future uh, and, and potential risky situations and have a, a safety plan for themselves about how they want to approach that. Yes, using drugs can be an inherently risky thing to do. But when you're in that situ situation, how do you keep yourself safe? And so this type of safety plan is really uh, geared towards as it says on the screen, increasing our, our internal and external supports or the participants' internal and external supports and decreasing potential harms. Uh, so a number of components to a plan like this, we want to make sure that we're helping people identify their personal triggers, right? What are the things that led you here that are going to contribute to you wanting to use? What per internal resources do you have, right? Um, I know that I'm really able to kind of keep myself calm in the face of stress uh, or... Uh, I got these really great breathing exercises I do, or I've got, you know, a good support system around me, et cetera. We can help people identify their natural social supports and potential distractions when they're faced with uh, harm. We can help people adjust their environment for personal safety, right? So yes, you're going to engage in this risky behavior, but maybe we do it in a way that is kind of not very public that you um, have your people around you, that it's a safe place, that the cops aren't gonna come barging in, uh, et cetera. We can help people adjust their environment to increase the level of safety. Um, if you're using, making sure that the floor is swept and you've got um, uh, a sharps container that you're putting your sharps in is safer than not doing that, right? Than having sharps all over the floor. Uh, and so helping people adjust their environment. Having a list of professional supports, you're probably on that list already, right? Um, identifying yourself, the phone numbers to call, uh, maybe crisis supports, um, et cetera. Who are all the professional supports? Um, and then the final step of a safety-based kind of goal plan in reducing harm would be having a specific order that they follow, right? Hopefully, they're going to walk away with like something that they can hold, a piece of paper with their safety plan. They can shove it in their kind of wallet or pocket and having a lit kind of, a, I'm going to access these supports in this order, takes the thinking out of it, right? When we're high stress, when we're facing potential harm, my heart's beating fast, my eyes are wide, I don't know what to do. Um, having kind of a, like to take the thinking out of it, I'm doing this. And if that person doesn't answer the phone, I'm doing this. Uh, and if I'm, if I'm not answering, you know, if that person doesn't answer the phone, then I'm going here, right? Having a list of an order uh, that people can access these components. I'll show you a copy of Pathways' uh, personal safety plan. It's got all these components on it. Um, you know, what are the signs I might be in a bad situation? Things I can do to take my mind off my problems. These are like internal resources. Um, people that can distract me if I'm feeling unsafe. Um, and sometimes not addressing the root of the problem, that's not what we necessarily want to be doing in a risky situation. Just giving some distraction and, and some space is the key at that moment. Uh, places I can go, oopsie. Um, things I can do to make the area around me safe. Here's the professional agencies on the right side. And then finally, the, the steps for what to do when I feel bad and I might need support. We tend to do this like pretty early in the process with folks when we're first meeting with them, uh, but also return to it. Because the continuum of use suggests that people aren't going to stay uh, in one spot with their risky behavior, we may need to reevaluate their, their, you know, this personal safety plan. I was using in a bingy way before, but now I'm using in a more kind of chaotic and persistent way. The risks are changed there and my safety plan needs to reflect that risk. Um, let me pause there. I see some stuff happening in the chat. So I see, um, Sue, your question. We haven't discussed the issue of parents doing drugs and the safety of their children. What are your comments about that? Um, so I'll start by saying Pathways doesn't serve children. And one of the reasons why we serve adults specifically is because of the complexities of, of this harm reduction issue when there are children involved. Um, families 
are super complicated and challenging to serve in a harm reduction context. Um, and we're not personally experts in that. Um, but maybe Kahlo can speak a little bit to like what happens. No, people are not permitted to have their children in their, like living in their apartments, but sometimes it like, it starts to move in that direction. And so there are some things that we have to do. Can you talk to, about that a little bit, Kahlo? Yeah, so while Pathway doesn't house children, our participants can certainly have children as guests in their unit if they want. You know, there's family, neighbors, whatever. Um, but when we know our folks maybe are using substances or using them like chaotically, or like maybe we have hesitations about like, what does it look like to bring a child into this unit? We want to have the conversation upfront about just what it, reporting measures we have to do on our end um here in pa if there is like evidence of um substance use so like any sort of works or paraphernalia in a unit and evidence of a child um there needs to be a child line report um and that causes a lot of stress for people right so we want to be having that conversation as early as we can i'll give you an example we um had to make a child line report for a participant who there was evidence of a child and evidence of substance use and evidence of some weapons in the unit, right? Um, all reasons that this needed to be reported. But there was no actual weapons. We couldn't see any actual substances and there was no actual child that we could see like at the time of that home visit. Um, but there was like bullet holes in the floor, right? Um, works, so like empty syringes and whatnot out and about and like children's shoes. So that's why we need to end up making that report. Um, and that's when we were like, oh, we should have this conversation kind of on early. On my team, that was, on my team, that was the decision. That was the moment we were like, okay, we need to have this conversation earlier with folks so that they know kind of like what their units need to look like. And also like that this can cause a lot of stuff if they don't get it together. So uh, yeah, for us, it looks like a conversation on the front end. But again, we don't support children directly. If, if, for whatever reason, we did have a child that was living in a unit. There needs to be a home visit every day, twice a day, until that child is out, um, including the weekend. Um, that's something we have had to do also um, once on my team. But um, yeah, that's how kind of Pathways handles that right now. Yeah, sorry, Sue, that it's not a super... Um we're simply not able to to, to support children in that way. Um, but I do know that there are some organizations that are kind of taking the housing first approach and a harm reduction approach with families. Um, super complicated. I think that's so hard. And I think that's amazing work because let's not pretend like people with children don't use drugs, right? Like that is, that is a fact of life that is happening. People are making those decisions. Um, and I think my understanding of the continuum of use suggests that simply the the use of drugs is not inherently a safety factor, uh, right, uh, for those children. Uh, and so I think personally, um, we need to bring a ton of nuance to that, to that idea. Um, but you heard what we do with at Pathways, right? We have to make that report if we see evidence of those of those things coexisting. Um, okay. Oh, yep. Yeah, of course. Um, the last tool we wanted to share, and then we're going to take a little break, um, a, a short break, and then come back and do just a bunch of case study stuff. So we got a good hour and a half left at this point. Uh, so this is going to be a, a good amount of time for discussion. Um, hey, Ryan, so, really quickly. Um, we had yeah, two Felicia. people ask. Yeah, we had two people ask for the um, last um, document. Is that going to be sent out with the materials as well? Yeah, the safety plan. Yeah, we'll send a copy of the safety plan out with the materials. Um, and then, of course, you're welcome also, once we send the slides out, folks, to kind of look at the components of that safety plan and maybe maybe develop language for your own form if, if that's more preferable, you know, something that fits your agency's language and, and, and context. Um, so you'll get both. Perfect. Thank you. I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, thanks, Felicia. Um, okay, so the final tool. Uh, I love this tool so much from a harm reduction perspective. Again, Maybe I'm alone in this boat, but sometimes when faced with like a case, right, or, or or challenging behavior when we're serving somebody, it can feel a little overwhelming to know like, what's the right thing? What's the right way to support this person who's engaging in pretty risky behavior? And so for me, I love this risk set setting as a starting point 
for, for your team to talk about what's actually going on with this person and how are we going to support them? Uh, so we'll go through the three components. Um, the risk is the risk itself, like the drug, the drug use that they're engaging in or the sex work that they're engaging in or the choice to not take mental health medication, right? Uh, and so we examine all the components of the risk itself. Um, what issue is being presented? Um, what are the possible sources of harm that might be connected to this main issue, right? If I'm um, an injection drug user, one possible risk of harm is that I share needles and that we pass transmissible transmissible disease, right? An obvious self-harm um, uh, thing. That's why syringe exchanges exist. So we want to kind of think through all the possible harms. Um, wound wounds may may come up there, or overdose may be a, a potential potential harm in this this case, right? Thinking through all of the the components of the risk, mm -hmm. and in particular, what is the method of use? If they're an in injection drug user, or do they snort their substances? Do they smoke their substances? This all has an effect on the relative risk that somebody experiences. Injection drug use is riskier than um, smoking a substance. Um, and so kind of identifying all of that. And then, and then also, what's the amount that they're using? This person injects a bundle a day. This person injects two bags a day. Um, it's, it's worth pulling all of that into our assessment of risk in collaboration with the participant. So once we've got the risk worked out, it gives us, I, I kind of think of it as like levers to pull on, right? Um, so here's here's how they're using and what they're using. What if we talk to them about the amount that they're using, right? That's one way to adjust the risk. Or we don't talk about the amount that they're using. We talk about the intake method. Hey, it's, it's safer in some ways to... Um, to snort this, this particular drug. Here are the health pros and cons of snorting versus injecting. Let's talk about that. Is this a space that feels practical and realistic to adjust for you? Um, and if not, maybe we go on to something else. Hey, this drug can get you this feeling in a safer way than this drug, right? Uh, it, it, so we're adjusting the risk. The next component of risk set setting is the set. And what we mean by this is the mindset, right? The kind of emotional state that somebody is bringing into the situation. Uh, including their thoughts, their mood, their expectation when they engage in this risky behavior. I expect nobody's going to bother me and I'm just going to be totally dead to the world and nodding out for like three hours. That's what I want and expect in my experience. Um, and so kind of talking through with people, how are they feeling? Are they feeling confident when they engage in that risk behavior? Are they feeling angry typically, anxious typically? Are they physically in pain, right? Understanding that many people use drugs uh, to cope with physical or emotional pain. Um, do, do they need to get well, right? Are they um, experiencing symptoms of withdrawal typically because it's hard for them to scratch up the money to, to, get, to get well? Um, when you meet with them, can they engage with me fully, right? Are they able to kind of like be present? Um, are their basic needs being met? All of this uh, are these, all of these are kind of components of their mindset. They're set. And all of these offer space to adjust, right? Um, I know this is a, a little bit of a silly example, but if a person is really anxious every time they engage in this risky behavior before they do it, can we help them through some grounding techniques, some breathing exercises to kind of get themselves in a steadier place before they use? If they are able to do so, they're going to use in a safer way, a way that feels less urgent, less pressured, um, less... I don't know, kind of intense in that way. So we can help people adjust their mindset. And then finally, the setting is another space for adjustment and another space to approach harm reduction decisions. So literally, what is the physical environment where that potential risky behavior is, is occurring? Um, certainly in Kensington, it's kind of very much operates like a open air drug market kind of, kind of space, right? People are out walking around, using, sitting on the ground, sitting on park benches, um, in groups, independently, et cetera. This is all sort of happening out in the open. Um, that's worth examining. Is there a safer place for you to do this? Are you worried about getting mugged when, you, um, uh, when you're using? Um, or um, are you able to use with people, right? What, who are your social supports? That's always gonna be safer to use with somebody than to use alone. You can't Narcan yourself. Right. And so kind of having, do you have Narcan available as a, as a component of the environment as well? 
Um, yeah, I see Carrie's comment that diverting prescribed medications for drug use is a common risk, right? Yeah. Uh, and so some, some people start with prescribed uh, pain medications and, and move in the direction of non-prescribed medications, right? Um, who's around the person when they're using? Are police around? Are there bystanders? Are there other participants around? Um, how do you present to those people? Do you present as someone who people perceive as threatening? Or do you present as somebody who is perceived as vulnerable? All of these offer room to uh, kind of toggle. I, I, I like the metaphor of like levers that we can tug on to help increase the relative safety of the participant. So risk set setting uh, is a great starting point, I think, for examining what's happening with a person. All right, I think we're in our kind of case study component. So let's take, um, we've been talking for a long time. Let's take five minutes. I have 39 past the hour. Let's come back at uh, 1045, uh, 45 minutes past the hour. And we'll walk you through one case study and then we'll kind of have you kind of talk through your own case studies in groups. Um, so we'll see you in about five minutes. Alrighty, so just some things we can be thinking about while I read this case study um, is just what are some of the risks um, or potential consequences we might want, we might want to mitigate um, with Lisa. Um, that's who this case study is going to be about. Um, alrighty, so this says that Lisa is a 55 year old woman with diagnosis of bipolar one disorder and cocaine use disorder. She's been living independently off and on for approximately six years. During this time, she's been evicted from two different apartments due to excessive foot traffic and damages to the unit. She's currently housed in a large multi-unit apartment building and is at risk of a third eviction for the same reasons. Lisa reports regular use of crack cocaine and alcohol. She expresses ambivalence about changing her relationship to substances, but will engage in conversation about substance use openly with staff. Lisa has a good friend named Teddy, who is also in the program, and they frequently use together in her apartment. Lisa has recently reported a concern for her safety and has requested to move, stating she owes money to drug dealers who live in her building. She's also reported to previous sexual relationships with the maintenance staff who work for the apartment complex. Lisa has a daughter who works as her home health aide. Her daughter has four children and brings them with her to the unit. The team suspects they regularly stay at the apartment. We've also noticed that tasks typically completed by home health aid do not seem to be occurring, as Lisa still requests significant assistance with shopping and cleaning. Lisa suffers from osteoarthritis and reports significant pain and impairment in mobility. She uses a walker, and her doctor has recommended a bilateral hip replacement. She's been scheduled for surgery on her right hip for the last seven months, but the procedure keeps getting pushed back because Lisa repeatedly fails the urine drug screen she's required to submit before receiving anesthesia. Alrighty, so this is the case. Um, what are some immediate thoughts and reactions just about Lisa um, in this specific case study? Maybe some specific strategies you think might be helpful. Or Ryan, I actually have a question. Do we, is this, are we asking for feedback here or walking through like what we, what we've done? I think we should, um, here, let's go to the next slide, actually. Um, okay. Well, let me pause there. Folks, I, I dropped a link to the case studies in the chat. You can click that and it'll take you to a PDF document where you can still see the case written up because we're going to shift the slide over to some questions that we want to ask you all. Uh, and then as we get into our breakout groups, you'll be able to use that link to um, to see the document of, of your case study when we're all in our separate rooms. Um, so this is the case study for Lisa. And we want to kind of walk you through what are the risks that people are seeing, right? We'll start there. What risks are you seeing in Lisa's case? And you can feel free to unmute, um, throw stuff in the chat, whatever feels right for you. Uh, I see the risk of her daughter coming and bringing four minor children. Uh, this is Valerie Bradshaw as an immediate risk. I. I see the risk of the daughter being the care aide also and her 
constantly seeking assistance for the services that the daughter is supposed to be taking her to um, provide. I see all this, but I won't speak and not give anyone else an opportunity, but those, those were just immediate in my mind. Yeah, that that's great. Um, really identify quickly that there we even this issue that we just talked about through Sue's question earlier, right? Um, their children seem to be present pretty actively, and we know that she's got active drug use, right? Active, she's an active drug user, and so yeah. Yeah. what what potential risk is there? I love your idea of um, identifying that she's getting home health services. That's great. We love that for folks, right? Especially if they've got kind of significant medical issues the way Lisa seems to, but she's not getting the care that she's supposed to. So, you know, it, it's almost like, I, I think we can view this through the lens of a risky behavior because she is making a choice. And we see this with our participants all the time to uh, get her medical care through a family member right? or get her home health care through a family matter, member. Um, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. It works. And yet that ends up being a riskier choice, especially given her, her health status. It's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's some other risks folks pointed out here in the chat. Um, the sex relations with the maintenance staff folks are picking up on. Risk of losing her mobility eventually. This is a big deal too. Uh, deals with the client directly. Um, and is a very significant health issue. Uh, yeah. Physical needs here. I want to kind of point out um, for Carrie's comment that sex for housing with the maintenance employee, actually, we're the ones providing housing in this case. So the sex is not in order to maintain their housing, but perhaps we don't know from the case study whether that sex is being traded for like maintenance support. Uh, it shouldn't be because we have a whole maintenance team uh, that she should be able to access, but but potentially, right, to be treated more quickly or, or more favorably, that's possible. I think probably more likely in this case, it was sex for sex sake, as opposed to like trading for uh, support. It could have been support if she had damaged the unit and didn't want your maintenance people to know the severity of the damage. So in exchange for the sex, she has this guy come in and make the repair. I also think about her um, taking drugs on credit from people in the building. And now there's a safety issue because she owes this money and they're going to be coming to the apartment for their money. And, she, and you know, and again, the kids are in there, the daughter's in there. They want their money, and they're not going to stop until they get paid. So. Yeah, and that's definitely happening in this case. Uh, she's owing the drug dealer's money. It's not the first time she's had to, like, move on from a place as a result of this. Um, and, yeah, so her physical safety is at risk as a result of this this money issue. Absolutely. Good one. Yeah. Um, great. Uh, here are some ones, ones that we wanted to just put up on the screen. Um, in addition to what you've said here, I think you've covered a lot of this. Uh, risk for eviction for having too many people coming uh, and going from her unit. This is one that kind of pops up for us quite a bit, actually, right? Like we get complaints from neighbors or from landlords directly saying, there's just like too much traffic in and out of this apartment. You're, you're turning this apartment into kind of like a hot spot. And many of the people that are coming through are drug dealers or other drug users, right? The quote unquote, like unsavory people that they don't want in their apartment building uh, ends up causing problems for our folks. So yeah, that risk of eviction as a result of that traffic is a pretty common one. Um, her safety, her substance use may put her safety at risk due to interactions with the dealers in the building. Y'all covered that one pretty well. Um, small children in her unit. And, spe and specifically um, that there may be paraphernalia in the unit that children could access or um, come across, whether maybe she's directly using while she's in the apartment with them. That, that's an unanswered question as far as what you saw in the case study, uh, but that risk there. Um, potentially she leaves them alone in the unit while she goes out and um, meets up with Teddy or goes out and meets up with dealers. A lot of potential areas for risk there with the children involved. And then we marked also that, that her overall health and well-being are at risk due to not being able to maintain food shopping and cleaning on her own, right? She's needing that home health aid support, but it's not happening in a way that is fully supporting her needs. Um, and so the, so she still has those needs. They're just being unmet, 
right? Um, and then we talked about, and you all covered this one, uh, risk of losing her mobility eventually is what somebody said. Her hips put her at risk for falls. Um, and then her current substance use is a barrier to getting surgery, right? So the like obvious thing here is go get a hip replacement surgery. The doctor wants to do that for you, but your substance use is presenting a barrier, right? They're not willing to undergo the surgery while you have cocaine in your system. All right. Let's shift into this next question. What consequences do we want to mitigate? Right. If you're the case manager working with Lisa, it kind of has an overlap with the risks, but it's a little different. What do we want to see not happen? How do we want to mitigate? What do we want to mitigate for Lisa? Not losing her housing. 100%. Yeah. That's kind of like the ultimate harm from our perspective. So yeah, thanks for, for shouting that out, Holly and Trinette. I saw your eviction uh, comment there. Absolutely. Not having a serious health issue from failing to pass the drug screen for the procedure for the hip. Yeah, I'm, ultimately, I, to, to me, I think the, the consequence that we want to mitigate is like a potential fall, right? Or, or a loss of even further mobility as a result of that. Yeah. Um, bodily injury as a result of uh, bartering for drugs when she knows she can't pay the drug dealer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we don't want to see her harmed by these drug dealers. Um, and, and Carrie noted that too, staying safe from the dealers who she owes money. Um, I see your comment, Sonia, about uh, if the first step is that her harm does not harm others. Uh, that was a comment that Kahlo had made earlier, removing the children slash grandchildren. I think a more like um, specific thing that I would say about this is the consequence that we want to mitigate is any harm coming to the children. Right. That's like more a more specific way of, I think, saying what you're what you're saying. Um, yeah, Ashley, you're jumping ahead to like, what do we do about it? Uh, and so I'm, I'm, I'm still here on like uh, what what consequences do we want to mitigate? So we talked about eviction. We talked about other physical harm from like the mobility issues. We talked about um, harm coming to the children. Um, I see you unmuting, Holly. Go ahead. Losing her natural support. So if something was to happen to the children, her family support would be gone. Yeah, what about the relationship with the daughter and perhaps other members of the family? There, there's something there. There's a reason why the daughter is providing the, the home health support. Uh, she is serving as an act of support, even if we would love to see that support be strengthened, right? So yeah, absolutely. The, the loss of natural community supports. That's a great one. Thank you. Any last ones that we want to talk about? Additional health risk is she having risky sexual behavior? She's sleeping with these random people. You know that that could be an issue. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, one of like the most like traditional and and like helpful harm reduction like tools that we have is safe sex conversations, right? And 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 the use of condoms. Um, and so like we want to mitigate any sort of potential harm that could come via the sex that she's having. It seems like Teddy is mostly the one that she's having sex with. So um, to me, that seems like an, an easier conversation to have around like, hey, when you're meeting up with Teddy, what needs is that like helping you meet? And 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 what are the ways that we can help make sure that that is a safe encounter? And I have um, a so we'll throw, oh, go ahead, Sue, go ahead. Um, is, is her bipolar being treated? And is that the impetus to a lot of the other problems? That's a great question. Certainly there's no requirement for that, but we don't really see mention of it in this case study of like, what are we doing? So maybe that's, a, maybe we need to speak to that a little bit more in the risk uh, slide, right? Like um, the risk of untreated bipolar disorder may be contributing to all of these other risks. It's a great point. Thank you. Yeah, I'm seeing, uh, Trinette, your comment, loss of much needed medical care if her daughter cannot be her home health aide and she can't get the needed the needed surgery. That's a great one. Thank you. Um, so you said all these, but I'll just put them up on the screen. Eviction, potential harm from dealers, overdose. Um, you know, even though like uh, crack use, I think is, the, is her drug of choice, uh, crack cocaine is her drug of choice. I think what we're finding is fentanyl is showing up in like every drug that um that our participants are coming in contact with even even weed uh and so 
the potential for overdose is there if people are accessing street drugs, uh, quite simply. Um, any harm to her grandchildren and or potentially having them removed from their mother's care would be would be a consequence we want to mitigate. And then her worsening health. So I think you all covered that pretty well. Thank you. And Oh, and then a fall or an injury. Okay, so for you, you're the case manager or you're on the treatment team. What's your end goal for Lisa? What are you hoping to accomplish with Lisa? Like if you could kind of paint the picture in an ideal way, what would you like to see accomplished? Okay, so Ebony is mentioning um, if we could reduce her use in order to accomplish the surgery. So the surgery is a good end goal for you, uh, Ebony. You're wanting to see that. Ooh, Carrie, get into the heart of the matter. Ask Lisa her goals. Yeah, like we, we don't really see mention of it in here, but like what does Lisa want for herself? Um, and what what risk is she willing to live with, right? It's a good one. Others, what other goals do you have in mind for her? I would like to see her stay stably housed. Is it what would it look like for her being able to stay in that unit versus facing a third eviction? Yeah. So like kind of thinking about like mitigating that eviction, what would have to happen in order for her to stay here? Right. Uh, or or let me broaden that, as you mentioned in the beginning of your comment, to stay stably housed. And I think that could look like staying in that unit or maybe moving to a different unit potentially. Ooh, I'm seeing stuff roll in. Here we go. Um, Megan saying necessary medical care being provided. And I wonder what that would look like, Megan. Like, what are your thoughts there? What in an ideal world, what would you like to see with that? Uh, Stacy mentioning stabilization and housing, substance use, safety, and medical in that order. Okay, I like your priority list, right? Like, you're. It's not going to be possible to kind of like solve every problem for every person, but kind of I think having a priority list at least of potential risk and safety issues to discuss with Lisa might be a, a really good goal. So I like that prioritization list. Um, re reduce cocaine use for surgery and let her know it is a temporary usage. Ah, so you're really bringing in kind of the harm reduction concept here that like just reducing doesn't mean you have to stay here. But what if we did it temporarily, right? To achieve this goal that I think both of us have. I love that as a way to kind of bring harm reduction into the conversation. Um, uh, find ways for her to interact with the children in supervised settings. Ah, I think what you're I, touching on here, uh, Sonia, is that I would bet she really cares about these grandchildren, right? And would not want to see them taken away such that she couldn't interact with them. And so like, how do we make that safer, right? Are there safe places that they can go and meet where there's not active drug use happening? Uh, and so kind of try, trying to like tap into what are her like felt needs as we adjust what, what's happening. Um, maintain housing, safety, address mental health and medical care. And then Ashley saying, try to get to the root and what are her triggers and what we can do to help her avoid them. I'd be very curious, Ashley, to think more through like the root of what? I think there are a lot of issues here. Um, the root of what? The root of the substance use, the root of the medical issues, the root of the medical care stuff. I, th I think it's worth thinking that through in a, in a, in a, a nuanced way. Trinette, what will it take to get the surgery? What's the minimum they need to do the surgery? Yeah, I love your thinking here, like <laughs> practical and realistic. Uh, discuss safer choices with substance use and how she can maintain her stability and what changes she could make. Um, she, yeah, several people kind of touching on this idea. She needs to identify her own goal. Our intervention, our end goal should be to help her identify her goals, right? What does recovery look like for you? What does a life worth living look like to you? Um, and maybe Teddy is a part of that, <laughs> that life. I don't know. Um, yeah, Rachel really hammering home the point of, I would say, reduce risk of housing first. Okay, got it. Yeah, more coming in here. Reduce her physical discomfort. Yeah, having a compromise in the goal for surgery. Okay, cool. All right, so let me put some on the screen here. What are the end goals? Keeping her housed. You all hit that pretty heavy. Uh, physical safety and avoiding violence, right? Protecting, I'd love to adjust the environment in some way or adjust the interactions in some way 
that she is not at risk for physical violence from these drug dealers. Um, moderating her substance use, hopefully in service of um, getting that surgery, getting her the in-home support she needs. And so maybe that looks like changing the support that she's currently getting access to uh, and then undergoing the hip replacement surgery. Okay, would love to hear, and I think you're starting to touch on this in the chat already. We identified the goals. We identified what we want to mitigate. What interventions are we using to get there? Any of the tools that we talked about so far kind of speaking to you as a tool that you might use to have one of these conversations? Let's say that your primary goal for her is to avoid the physical harm from the drug dealers, or let's say it's to make sure that the children are being unharmed. What tools are you using to get here? What interventions from anything that we've talked about so far or maybe anything else? Holly mentioning the uh, the honest budget that yeah the honest the honest budget um, can you talk to me a little bit more about that Holly like what are you thinking there like why why specifically or which issue are you hoping to kind of touch on there so I, for the moment anyway she's using and she's going to have to figure out how to pay back the um, dealers in her apartment. Yeah, maybe there's some maybe we can figure out how to help her have enough money to sort of satisfy that drug dealer need. Mm -hmm. It's almost like a payment plan that you're helping her set up with the drug dealers <laughs> if they're willing to accept <laughs> such. Um great, I like it. I like it. Um other ideas people are having. Yeah, Deborah mentioning the safety plan and the readiness ruler. Uh, so working on a care plan where she can identify her goals and active steps she's willing and able to take to get there. Yeah, we have to be on the same page as her, but I like your idea about the safety plan because it comes up in different ways, right? And maybe you have several safety plans. Maybe you have a safety plan related to the drug dealers. Maybe you have another safety plan related to um, if you experienced a fall. Or, you know, you know, your health started to deteriorate in some way. It's okay to have sort of multiple safety plans. There are multiple things that seem unsafe in this situation. And so kind of having different approaches, different resources, different supports uh, that we bring to the table uh, could be could be useful. Uh, Trinette, the readiness ruler, really found find out where she's at. Trinette, I'd be curious, I, I, just because I'm forgetting like what you talked about earlier in the chat. Um, what issue do you think you'd bring to bear with the readiness I, well, rule. I know I've said a lot about the surgery, but is, you know, is she even ready for this is where, what does she see? Um, you know, maybe she's not there yet. Maybe she doesn't feel like that's what she needs. Um, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I keep talking about Teddy so much because I think that Teddy is meeting like a key need for her right? Of belongingness, of care, of yeah. something that maybe resembles love. I, I don't know. I haven't talked to her. Um, and so I, I bring up Teddy to say, she may be way more invested in trying to figure out that than she is about like dealing with her hip or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Uh, so your idea is to use the readiness roller to sort of figure out like what, to maybe have the goal conversation. Like what do you, what mm -hmm. are you ready for? What is important to you right now? Yeah. Uh, what are those barriers? What are those you know, think we may think that that's one of the most important things she needs to do, but if she's not there, you know, I guess it kind of helps establish those priorities as well. Yeah, I think you're right on. Um, Valerie, I saw you were unmuting. Did yeah, you want to add? She, she spoke to what I was going to speak to, but in a little bit of a different way. I was thinking of the readiness ruler and not just so much the hip, but just her life. Um, how ready are you to not know the drug dealers? She's got a she's got an a substance problem. Um, she's not looking to go into rehab to fix a substance problem. Uh, what's the monthly income looking like for her? If she's disabled and on a limited income, she may not have enough money in her budget to support her habit to begin with. And so, how ready are you? You know, we want to settle the debt with the drug dealer, but are you going to go make that debt again in two weeks? So really, you know, we know where we want her to be. Where does she want to be? Because what it looks like for us and what it's going to look like for her may be two different things. I think that's such an important point. And I also want to um, maybe advocate for using these tools 
in more specific ways. I think you're right. Everything I agree with everything that you said, but I think if we approach a conversation like, hey, let's use this readiness ruler to figure out where you're at in your life, that feels like a really big conversation. Yeah. Um, and so I think kind of both and I think I'm saying like, yes, let's assess like, where does she want her life to be? What does she want her to look like? And then once we have sort of honed in a little bit, I think we can start to bring these tools in, in an even more nuanced way to say, okay, so you say X, Y, and Z is most important to you. Yeah. Then we can use the readiness ruler to go further. Go go ahead, Valerie. I see you chiming in. I'm agreeing. Yes, you're fine. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Cool. Um, and then even, um, yeah, sorry, I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, find her readiness for more supports is what Carrie was suggesting. Yeah. So I think you're going to, you're going to use these tools most effectively if if you're on the same page of what is the specific issue that we're talking about. And I think harm reduction is really about that, right? Like there's a ton of stuff that is risky in her situation, um, but not everything is she gonna be willing to actually have an open conversation with you about or adjust risk set setting with, right? So um, honing in on that and then using these tools in a very nuanced way. What's the specific behavior that you're ready to change? Not just like, are you ready to stop using drugs? Well, no, that's way too big. Are you ready to only use drugs out at your friend's place so that there's no paraphernalia in the home, right? Or um, so that the drug dealers aren't coming to your apartment, right? That's a very specific behavioral component of the larger behavior of, of substance use. Um, I see Tony suggesting to change the drug of choice to a similar drug such as methadone uh, and explain its temporary reduction and it is free. Okay, so kind of uh, exploring the idea of drug replacement. Um, well, methadone, I think, would definitely apply more to like an opioid use pattern, but I like your idea of maybe ex exploring uh, options of drug replacement to hopefully meet some other goal. I like it. Um, cool. Anything else that people are, 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 are thinking through as far as interventions that they might use? Yeah, uh, so I see you, Trinette, saying uh, we're sharing the risks that we're concerned with, uh, but really finding out what she's worried about and then have a conversation her, her about why we are worried about certain things. Yeah, so she may not be concerned about the same things as us at all, but that doesn't close the door on us still saying, hey, I'm concerned about some of these things, right? And and here's potential risk areas. That's okay to do. Um, harm reduction is not about turning a blind eye to risk. It's definitely about like bringing, shining a light on them, but doing so in, in a non-judgmental way. Right. Oh, you're concerned about these things. I'm concerned about these things. Let's prioritize together, I think, is the conversation. Yeah. Great. Um, OK, so let me put up on the screen a couple of other ideas about strategies we can use to get to some of our end goals. Um, we could use the continuum of use to explore her relationships to substances. Right. What's she getting out of it? Is it like a social thing? Right. Uh, that she can connect with people. Is she binging? Um, is she only doing it when she's trying to like escape from these feelings of unsafety with the drug dealers? We need to know her reasons. And I think we can start to use the continuum of use to get at that a little bit. Honest budget to discuss debts. Holly touched on that pretty well. Um, maybe the readiness ruler to talk specifically about the hip replacement, right? The hip replacement is an obvious thing. We're, we, you know, we're not being too directive to say, I'm concerned that you might have a fall. And I know that this hip is causing you some pain. How important might it be for you to get this hip replacement surgery? The doctor's recommending it. What's the level of importance there, right? How ready are you? How confident are you? Can be the conversation that we have there. Um, and then yes, the safety plan to discuss the relationship with the building neighbors. So great, I think you all touched on all of that pretty well. Want to take the opportunity uh, before we move on from this case to kind of pull back the curtain and talk about like what we actually did with Lisa, like what worked, maybe what we tried and didn't all all the way work, right? Um, so number one, to preempt an eviction, what we chose to do was to relocate Lisa to a new unit, one that was further away from those drug dealers where they don't know where she lives anymore. But I think it's really important to have that conversation with her that, hey, 
when you're inviting those drug dealers to your space, now they know where you live, right? We've already seen what it looks like to be on the receiving end of safety threats in your space where they know where you live. Your family's at risk, you know, your grandchildren, yourself, other neighbors find this problematic, right? So the relocation is not just like, a, hey, we're moving you. It's a, it's a, we're moving you. And, and these are the reasons, these are the rationale. Here's what you need to know. Here are the potential consequences of bringing those folks back into your space. What really worked for Lisa was to move her into a smaller building, right? And so she was in kind of like a large congregate type building. Um, and we put her in like one, like um, kind of one of these row homes that's been converted into apartments, right? And so there are fewer neighbors there, fewer people to get into it with. Um, and also the unit itself was a little smaller. Um, so our big concern is that she's perhaps providing a, a living space for her grandchildren. That's not, that's gonna be a risk of eviction for her in our program, right? And with her drug use patterns. And so putting her in a smaller apartment meant there was less space to house other people. Uh, and that really did work, right? The daughter was able to find housing of her own with her, with her children um, and allowed Lisa to have her own space. We did offer substance use treatment just because we're, you know, using a harm reduction strategy doesn't mean that we're not suggesting, hey, there's a substance use program that looks like this. Are you interested? Uh, she she was not interested. Um, but we want to continue to provide info, education, and support around that. We did engage her. I think I was so, I was so happy to hear you all suggest this. We engaged her around some drug use substitution, some drug substitution. And in fact, we worked with a doctor, a surgeon who really kind of took a harm reduction oriented approach. And he said, what if you just smoked a, just a boatload of weed for a very temporary period instead of the cocaine use? I don't care about the weed. It's the cocaine use that's going to interfere with uh, the anesthesia and, and the needed um, procedure to get this hip replacement. And guess what? That was practical and realistic for her. She said yes, and she got the hip replaced. Um, so you all were right on point in identifying that. Um, she hasn't gotten her second hip replaced yet. She did get the first one. Uh, so, you know, small successes, celebrate those small victories. Um, and then we connected her to a more formal, more formal home health agency, right? So she really did need that home health support. Um, that did have an effect on the daughter's income, but ultimately we're here to serve Lisa. And she agreed to this support. She saw the need for this additional support and, and was willing to, to kind of do that. Um, want to kind of just like talk really quickly through the idea that like these interventions that we used, we think it affirmed those harm reduction principles that we talked about in some specific ways. Um, so I'll put those up on the screen. In terms of health and dignity, we felt that the continuum of use really allowed us to like explore her very valid reasons for all of the things, the socialization needs that she was getting met through, uh, through Teddy, uh, the belongingness needs, um, her, her reasons for drug use, uh, et cetera. That's, that's the dignity that we're talking about is that your reasons are valid. And I want to hear those reasons and also your reasons have consequences. And so it's worth talking about those consequences. Um, I think it was pretty participant centered to put Lisa in a smaller unit in a row home. Um, everybody wants a bigger place. I don't think I've ever talked to anybody that doesn't want more space, but in terms of like a specific met need for Lisa, the smaller unit allowed her to be a little bit more contained, right? And, and, and caused less risk for eviction for her. Um, I think it was also really participant centered for with the drug replacement. She was willing and able to, to try that strategy and it worked for her. Um, oops, sorry. Let's see what else. Participant self-rule. We did offer education around substance use, info on treatment programs, but we didn't force the issue. Uh, and in that way, we sort of centered um, the therapeutic relationship and allowed Lisa to, to rule her own life and maintain her autonomy. And ultimately, she chose not to engage in treatment. Uh, let's see. Okay. And the last one, accountability without termination. So rather than like a, having her be evicted again, or perhaps terminating services, kind of preemptively moving her into a place where she could be more successful 
allowed us to have some of those accountability conversations, but not put her out on the street. Okay, let me pause right there. Questions, comments, thoughts people are having. Did she agree to move? Or was this, it? This is like a, a pretty nuanced converse way that I want to like mention this. It's a good question. Okay. Kinda, not really, right? It's, I mean, yes, she did agree to move, but her back was really up against the wall, right? Like you're at risk for eviction. Landlord mm -hmm. is not tolerating this anymore. You're gonna be evicted. We would like to move you. And this is the place that we would like to move you into. Mm -hmm. it, it is a choice, but it's a pretty limited choice. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? It's like pretty, um, I think it's on the on the coercive spectrum of choices if I if I had to say that. Yeah. So anyway. so if she had outright refused to do it, it this would have looked a lot different. Absolutely. If she said like no, this is my place. I mean, we we certainly would have um worked really hard to make sure that like the traffic in and out of her place could change or that the relationship to the dealers could change, the relationship with Teddy could um meet everybody's needs. We would have worked really hard on those things, but there is a chance that she would have just ended up evicted again, right? Through, through making that choice. Um, and I think we would have not been happy with that choice, but it happens regularly, right? One of the things that we'd like to say is the skill set of living independently, maintaining your tenancy is something that is learned over time. And we see that like a pretty good portion, maybe sometimes up to a third of our folks lose that first apartment that we put them in. And then when we rehouse them, that number halves, right? So people are learning, oh, okay, wait a minute. I did this, it, it ended up in this. Uh, and so we like to hold out hope that we can continue to help people learn how to successfully navigate this stuff. Lisa's been through a couple of times though. It may have ended up that we could rehouse her, but she's at the bottom of the list. Right. It may have taken some time to get rehoused. And that's part of our calculus with her. Yeah, you can stay here, but if you get evicted, it may be some time before we're able to get you back into a place. Okay, no, fine. Put me, put me in that place. You know what I mean? That's kind of the the calculus there. One of the things I, I'd like to add is that Pathways uses like an emergency relocation in the event that somebody's going to be evicted or on the street um like suddenly. And folks can turn down that emergency relocation. But like Ryan is saying, that might like prolong the time that they're like on the street again. Um, so there is some choice there. Um, but that is like a very complex choice like to make, I think, like Ryan is saying. All right. Okay. Without delay. Let's get back into it. I would love to put you into some breakout groups. Um, so we have four more cases that we're that we're going to talk about. Um, we got about forty minutes, forty five minutes. Um, sorry, forty minutes, and we're going to put you in groups of um, pretty large groups. So we have four cases. Each group is going to discuss one case, and what we'd like you to do is to um, kind of talk through these questions, right? The same ones that we talked through with Lisa, right? Examining in your case, what are the risks? What are the potential consequences? What's the end goal? What are the strategies that you think would be most helpful? And then how do we make sure that we're pulling in these harm reduction principles into our proposed strategies? Um, so I've got you broken out. Let me get those breakout groups ready. And I'm gonna give us 15 minutes to talk through your case before the room closes. And then I would love, make sure that you're choosing somebody that's willing and able to um, verbally speak out to the group and talk about your case. What did your group decide? You know, What were you thinking? What risk, et cetera. Um, so group one is gonna be the case on Derek. Group two is gonna be Robert. Group three is Sturgill. And group four is Darla. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and open the rooms. You're gonna be popped right in there. And let me make sure that you have access to the cases one more time. So there's the link for the cases. Your group name will be titled by like the name of the person that you're, you're doing it. So you'll see the title of the group there. 
Any questions? I know I just gave you a bunch of instruction. We good? All right, I'm gonna open the groups. I'm gonna screen share these breakout group questions and I'll, uh, yeah, I'll try to be supportive as we go. Here we go. I don't think I have a group yet, I guess. Me neither. I was trying to figure out the same thing. <laughs> oh, sorry. Let me go ahead and uh, manually put you in. I had created the groups a little bit ago, and I think maybe it just didn't do it. Hold on. I'm just finishing typing the group assignments real quick. Um, okay. There we go. Um, let's see. Uh, okay, we're gonna. So, how do we know which group we in? Um, the name you, you should see it on the top of the list. Just one more group. All right, sorry, here we go. Wait, let's see where we're gonna put you in. Uh, Darla, here we go. All right, so um, probably that didn't feel like enough time to talk. I saw people going right to the last minute on the breakout group, uh, so I apologize about that. But I do want us to have time to like bring this back to the group, the larger group. Um, so I was hoping maybe we could start with Derek uh, and the folks who were in the Derek group, uh, if there'd maybe be somebody willing to talk us through some of these questions um and we'll take it right from the top what are the risks what are the potential consequences we want to mitigate what's the end goal and what are the strategies we use to get there and then lastly how do our proposed interventions affirm those principles of harm reduction so if somebody from derek would chime in would love to hear that all right i was trying to take notes um we probably didn't hit everything because we needed more time but um so derek um is um a 50 year old male, there's concerns um, maybe with uh, drinking, there's concerns that he leaves out of. Uh, I Do you want me just to give a quick synopsis of it? Or yeah, just sure, that'd be helpful. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, he sometimes goes missing uh, for a few days, two, well, two days to three months. Um, there's concerns with the changes in his behavior. He's not um, taken his uh, seizure medication and there's the team thinks that he might be in early stages of dementia and, um, uh, you know, really concerned with, with not taking his medication. Um, and he wants to live independently. That's really, he likes living independently, but there's a lot of concerns when he, especially when he goes um, missing for a long time. So the risks that we identified is that there's no way for Derek to access his team or his support, and there's a loss of contact with him. Um, there's a, a risk that he continues to loot, lock himself out, lose his keys. He sleeps outside, uh, is in harm's way in the elements. Um, his health um, risk is that his, he's not compliant with his medications. 
Um, the change in his behavior is really concerning. Um, it looks like maybe he's a, usually, um, you know, can be really friendly and outgoing, but he's his um, mood is becoming more agitated um, and then a risk of ending up in an unfamiliar area um, with his blackouts and that sort of thing. So some of the consequences, of course, the worst one is that he could die. We're really worried that something could happen to him. He could have someone take advantage of him or be victimized. He could not know where he is. He's in a very unfamiliar area. He may have seizures, uh, which would land him in the hospital. And there, so a consequence may also be that he's not able to live independently um, like he wants. Uh, end goal um, is we came up with his independent living continue, like he's able to continue living independently, um, that we explore long-term care supports. Um, his safety is a big um, end goal and that his medication is managed. Um, some of the strategies we have, um, if he is involved with the with state benefits, we may be able to connect him with a, a free phone. Um, we Another strategy, strategy would be able to reach out to his family just to really get a better idea of what kind of support. Uh, it looks like they may be close by, but we were, it doesn't look like we know a lot about them. Um, Maybe look at a into a health care aid, um, and and really discuss long term care supports with uh, Derek, and then um, interventions. We didn't really get um, a lot to the interventions, but we did talk about connecting him with a free phone and having a medical assessment, and that's as far as we got. That's great. I love it. Uh, thanks for kind of outlining all, all that for us. I think you really did hit on all, on the major challenges. One of the things that we see regularly with cases like people like Derek, uh, and that in these discussions in, in training groups, um, sometimes, and I applaud you for not kind of jumping right into this, but sometimes po folks sort of want to wash their hands of a case like Derek and say, nope, that's nursing care. Sorry. Like we're not set up to serve those folks. Uh, and our perspective, at least at Pathways is we really want people to be, um, independent for as long as possible. Uh, and so I do think that there are many supports that we can bring to bear in the meantime, it may be that ultimately he ends up in a long-term care facility. Um, and so I like the way that you phrased it, which is that we want to be discussing the possibilities of long-term care, perhaps down the road with him, right? It, it shouldn't be a surprise, but also we want to do everything we can in the meantime to make, make cause like independence is a critical thing for him and independence is a critical thing that housing first can, can support, right? That's what we're here to do. Uh, and in our setting that does um, high fidelity housing for us, we do have an ACT team. It's a ton of people around him, right? And so, and an inter inter interdisciplinary support. Um, and so how do we step that up is, is always the question. Um, I'll pull back the curtain just a little bit and, and, and talk to you about some of the things that we tried. Um, a medical ID bracelet, right? Or like a medical alert call system kind of situation so that we can get people to him even if we don't necessarily always know where he where he is. Uh, one thing that we make heavy use of with uh, folks who get locked out of their units regularly, and we have a, a machine in the office that can make keys, right? So people are losing keys all the time. We're off, often making new keys for people. Um, but often those calls are coming at hours of the day where nobody's like available to go and like make a whole new key and come out. And we've done it, but it's not it's not great. We don't love it. Um, so one of the things we moved to for, for folks like Derek would be to put a lockbox on, on his door with like a key code, right? Maybe like his birthday as the, as the key combination so that he can easily access it. And often, um, either the key code or the lockbox, um, will open and there will be a key in there, but that is like tethered to the door. So he can't then lose that key too. Um, so that's been really effective to help people not have to spend nights on the street, or um, have staff running around at all hours of the night when it's kind of a simple fix. Um, in terms of medication compliance, he's willing to take medication. He's interested in taking medication, but it's not always clear that he is, or perhaps he's becoming forgetful around it. So one of the th strategies that we've tried to make use of, and we, and we did it with Derek, was we'll take one of those like big desk calendars, right? It's like, because it's, it's like jumbo sized. And we'll get the pharmacy to sort of blister pack his medications so we can have like the each day has its own sort of blister pack or whatever and we'll tape those to the calendar on the days of the week right so that it's pretty clear to us and to Derek 
did I take my medication to today? Wait a minute, what's the date? Oh, my medication is still taped to that date, right? So it's sort of like a very visual way to help manage that. That's sometimes been effective for folks, sometimes not, but it, but it's one of the strategies in our toolbox. Uh, we did connect, I think you all identified this uh, pretty easily. Uh, we connected Derek to a home health aide. That was really, really crucial for him uh, in getting his care needs met. Um, and then in terms of like how he's spending his time and like his interest in engaging and stuff like that, one of the things that was most effective was getting him connected to a day program, somewhere to go throughout the day where he had people in his life that he could socialize with, but that it was a little structured, right? Especially as like, you know, maybe there's early kind of dementia signs there, um, having a, a rhythm and a routine of people and a structure of a day program uh, was really effective uh, for Derek. Um, and we use we made use of the safety plan, especially when he's becoming lost. Uh, we use the readiness ruler around conversations like long term care, but also uh, it's, uh, around medication compliance. Like, what's going on? Do you want to take this medication? Um, are there barriers that we're not aware of? We use the readiness ruler to kind of have some of that conversation, uh, and then we're always using risk set setting to explore explore this stuff. Uh, great. Okay, thank you so much for 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 uh, working through that. The Derek group, uh, not easy, but um, that's that's what the cases look like. Um, let's get into the Robert group of people. Is there somebody that might be willing to speak to the Robert group? Somebody from the Robert group. I see your names on the Robert group. So I'm just going to start calling on people. You're not going to like that. All right, here we go. Um, Vanessa, Tracy, Sue, Stacy, two Stacy, Sonia, Lisa. Damien, we did Sturgia. We did Stur uh, We didn't do Robert. Oh, we maybe were supposed to, but we didn't. Oh, yep. did nobody I do Robert? I saw one Sturge also. We did him. Oh, uh, yeah. I I stupidly sent out an incorrect broadcast. Sorry about that. I confused you guys. Oh, uh, so maybe we don't have a Rob uh, a, a Robert group. So let's. I think we've got two groups then that um that looked at Sturgill. Um, so let's let's hop into Sturgill. Um, anybody willing to speak to Sturgill? Um, sure, I took notes. <clears throat> um, so with Sturgill, as far as the risks were concerned, um, he was a fall risk. Um, the fact that he didn't have much contact with anyone, whether it's family or um, his team, case managers or anyone, um, he ran out of food often, high blood pressure, uh, the lack of support. Uh, unless he had his meetings with his team. Um, the fact that he was in denial about his condition, um, no phone access, um, that he would give strangers money, um, possible eviction if he was inspected by the landlord, possible alcoholism, possible cancer, um, uh, non-med compliant, uh, that he was uh, potentially being taken advantage of by the strangers he was giving money to, um, and then God forbid he possibly died in the apartment and we didn't know it because no, he does, there's no way of anybody contacting him until the team shows up. Um, <clears throat> as far as mitigation, uh, we talked about like a home health aid being, connecting him with a home health aid being primary uh, because the home health aid could work towards the medication management, um, the food security, um, making sure that he has access to a phone, um, we talked about the home health aid arranging possible field trips um, to supported living environments so that he could start to see what that looks like. Um, and then hopefully, you know, if needed and when needed, uh, move towards the supported living environment. Um, and then that would also assist with him hopefully being able to have a cleaner home because there would be more people around. He'd have support to be able to do that. And then also with more people around, there would be less likely more people taking advantage of him. Um, 
our end goal is um, safe to have him housed safely and uh, to remove the isolation um, and then uh, create engagement for him. So a possible day program um, and then depending on what the supportive living environment looks like. Uh, principles, we got through a couple of them. So um, again, the home health aid, you know, assisting with the help with his health and the cleanliness, which will give him a level of dignity. Um, and then the participant involvement, uh, making sure that he is around other people um, that are potentially in his condition and or his age range so that he can see that they might not look weak, um, you know, also. So mirroring behavior with peer support. That's as far as we got. Great. Yeah, I love the mention of peer support, which hasn't really come up as much so far in our, our conversation today, right? Like as a critical tool. And, I, and I, let me just pause here and say, we give like full on harm reduction trainings, like just specifically about harm reduction. And one of the things we love to, to talk about is that like harm reduction is not a thing invented and put forward by like social workers and, and helpers. Harm reduction really grows out of like mutual aid movements people helping themselves and their members of their community. Um, and so we reference things like, um, you know, the feminist movement, especially of like the seventies, we, we reference things like the things like the young Lords and the black Panthers and ways that they, you know, put forward things like free breakfast programs and free health clinics. These are kind of, these were the outgrowths, of, uh, uh, you know, the original kind of underpinnings of harm reduction. And so to bring peer support into that conversation, I think is a really uh, critical component. So thanks. Um, Tony, I saw you unmuting. I don't know if you were in the same group as Stacy or, or the other group and wanted to shout out or anything you wanted to add. Um, I was in the opposite group. Um, Stacey and them had some great points. Our group, um, we talked about moving the, he was up on the top floor, moving them down to a first floor apartment, um, a medical alert um, device that he could um, carry with his cell. Uh, um, we talked about what his goals are and our goals. We talked about mama wheels, um, to bring in the food for him and that will give him, um, socialization as well. And he gets to choose his meals. Um, we also talked about, um, the importance to keep his independence as much as, as much as we can and bringing in a healthcare team to evaluate um, his apartment, like an occupational therapist, to evaluate, evaluate it and give him other adaptation skills. Hey, Tony, I love that. Um, the Stacy group, as well as the Tony group, uh, really great examples. And as I pull back the curtain here, you'll see, I, I, I'll note that y'all touched on, all, on like all, almost all the things that we did. Um, in terms of the food, we did connect him with, um, like manna meals delivery, which is I think similar to like mom on wheels. Um, we also were already kind of doing like a bi-weekly grocery shopping trip with the team. And that's one of the ways that we kind of get people out into the community is we'll take them on a shopping trip. Uh, and you know, like let's pick your food for the for the next two weeks. We upped that to weekly instead of bi-weekly. Um, we made sure that he had a walker and we would make sure that we, he, we, we wouldn't take him out without that walker. Um, yeah, we definitely moved him to a first floor unit. That was a critical thing for him. He needed to like have easier accessibility to his unit. Um, so that was great. Um, we also connected him, I think to uh, state one of Stacey's points, uh, kind of similar is that we connected him to a senior center to spend some time in like a day program type thing, but one that had transportation available. So they'd do the pickup, right? And then drop off. Uh, and so the transportation would be less of a challenge. We did also get him connected to a home health aid. Got him a phone. It's always tough with folks because- We'll do a bunch of work to get people phones and then they lose the phone by like the next week or two or whatever. So that's a kind of a constant grind of like making sure that people have access to a phone, but it's a critical one, right? Like we're the lifeline for folks and, and they need to be able to access us. Um, so yeah, we use things like the honest budget, the readiness ruler and the safety plan with, with Sturgill. Great ones. Do we want to, let's, let's really quickly uh, get into the Darla group. Is there somebody from the Darla group that can speak to kind of... Um, Last, last last things? Yeah, so I can just sort of touch on the risks that we wanted to mitigate as well as like the consequences we had thought about. So a big one was eviction, um, her having people over who were refusing to leave or causing um, disturbances. So we had talked about having like a discussion with her around boundaries, 
talking about who she wants to invite over, how to ask people to leave, what sort of rules she wants for her apartment and how she wants to enforce them. Um, another big aspect was sort of her intermittent care of like her physical, mental, and daily life. So we had talked about possibly seeing if a supervised um, living arrangement might be more appropriate or having someone in the home to sort of give that um, aid and support to her. Um, something that also we discussed was her sort of feeling isolation and her lack of social connect connection. So we had talked about possibly relocating her closer to family, um, finding, helping to find her son who she felt like was missing. Um, seeing if we could connect her to um, day programs or other opportunities to network and meet other people. And then that led to a conversation about her Ooh. alcohol use that she was willing to sort of reduce and maybe getting her connected to AA to capture both like the um, substance use as well as like the connection and the community. We had also talked about um, helping her to get more connected to the church that she attended intermittently. Um, and exploring any possible barriers to going there. Um, we had talked about checking in with her more frequently to see if she was making those connections and see if we could help to make any of those phone calls that would address sort of like the intermittent care of like her mental and physical health. Hey, I thought that's a great job you all did. I think you covered a lot of the things that we really ended up kind of pushing towards, especially like um, we really worked to kind of help get her connected to faith-based services as a way to like, for the spirituality component, as well as the combating the loneliness piece. Um, we also tried to offer a lot of ways to engage with the team more socially, right? We have a drop-in center. She can come and spend time, you know, use the computer lab, have coffee, whatever she wants to do. That That's all available at our, at our site. Uh, we did support her with a relocation to get away from folks that were causing her, that were abusing her. Uh, and we ended up moving her to a smaller apartment. Uh, similar to that other case that we talked about with Lisa. Um, we, we do continue to support her around her alcohol use, encouraging her to kind of tracking her her feelings and moods related to the drinking, really really in kind of like a pre-contemplation type strategy there, right? Like, well, what would it look like to kind of journal your moods that you're experiencing and as it relates to your alcohol use? Uh, we did eventually reunite her with her son and we're actually attempting to try and get her connected to a program where they can get her where they can live together. Um, so yeah, great, great, great thoughts there. Um, okay, folks, thanks for uh, kind of bearing with us as we went through that, those breakout groups. For us, um, it's a useful tool as in a breakout group to kind of like think through the tools that we offer, the strategies that we use in a harm reduction setting and expanding beyond how do we just get them to stop using their drugs, but what are the creative strategies to help mitigate the actual harms that people are facing that are putting them at risk of not maintaining their housing? Because that's always our, our number one goal. Um, so let me walk us through some final thoughts. I know we're like past the hour here. And I want to just kind of leave you with some, some final thoughts. We know that folks who are in need of services in a housing first capacity have a high level of need, right? Uh, as a result, they're not always going to be polite to us. <laughs> um, the, it would be great if everybody was super polite. That would feel so nice, wouldn't it? That's not the case. Uh, and we need to be able to sit with that and like be responsive to that and, and understand the sort of structural elements that have led people to where they are in their lives. They're sometimes going to forget about appointments <laughs> or show up late, right? It sounds so easy to say, oh, well, we have a conversation about increasing your social supports. Well, sometimes that conversation, there's a whole goal plan just to have that conversation, right? Uh, it, it can be challenging. Um, or they'll lose things, their medications, their paperwork, their keys, uh, or they're asking for things early that can lead to conflict, right? Refills on their medications or asking for financial disbursements. We often serve as like the representative payee for many of our folks, right? Oh, can I get a couple of extra dollars early? Uh, and so we're having those conversations constantly with folks. Or they have difficulty with transportation or need special accommodations. Or from our perspective, maybe they seem unmotivated. Right? These are some of the many challenges among many others that, that uh, come up in this work. And I think we could be tempted to have this idea that like, well, I can't help somebody who doesn't want to help themselves. And I hear that, right? And I've said that probably in the past too. Uh, so I want to leave you with this quote in response to that idea that our former director of nursing kind of was talking through with us before she left. She said, it's ridiculous to think somebody doesn't want to help themselves. I think if you're saying that about someone, you haven't really listened to them. 
You haven't met them where they are. You haven't done the work of understanding what's happening for them. And when people come to you, even somebody who is wanting to harm themselves, they're looking for a way to get relief. They're trying to help themselves in the way that makes sense for them at the time. And our role is to help people from that place where they are and help them figure out how they can take steps to help themselves. We help make them safer, help protect them, and help get them where they want to be. So I just wanted to offer that as a potential reframe, maybe also in response to LaDonna's comments. Like, how do you stay in the work? How do you how do you keep trying even when the choices don't always seem to be going the right way or the resources aren't there? So the challenges that many of our folks face do come from larger systems of oppression, structural oppression. They come from disability um, and the way that we approach disability. They come from poverty, uh, many of our folks. And so we're thinking through what does it mean to provide compassion using harm reduction in addition to what we traditionally think of as treatment. And then it's also important to think about what equitable care looks like for those, many of the folks that we're serving haven't cut it in other programs. They haven't been able to like make it through in other programs. And so thinking through what equitable care looks like for those that would have been maybe left behind. Uh, and I think accountability without termination plays a big role here. And then, you know, harm reduction and housing first are super hard. They're challenging practices. They're nuanced practices. We have to bring all of our creativity and patience and our empathy and then take care of ourselves on top of it, right? Which is hard, hard, hard work. Um, but the way that we do that is by sort of keeping the doors open to the possibility of change. No, they said no to a drug treatment program 55 times before this conversation, but I don't want to throw that out. Right? It's, still a, it's still a possibility, right? And so keeping the doors open is, is where we sit with that. Whew, we did it, folks. We are at a Q&A period. I know many people probably have to leave. So uh, before you leave, I am going to drop a link to the course evaluation. Make sure you grab that before you go. It'll take you to a short Google survey, and we'll follow up with an email to everybody who is registered as well. Um, but I'm able to stay for a couple of minutes if folks have like additional questions, comments, or thoughts. Um, and if not, if you need to run, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for participating and engaging with us. Uh, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. I'll, I'll stick tight for a few minutes if people have questions. See everybody. Thank you. See you, Ryan. Thanks for having me. Thank you. It was great to see you, Kalil. Thank you so much. Truly enjoyed it. Good to see you too. From my old desk also. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking at it like, oh, is this what I looked like? Thank you, Ryan and Khalil. <laughs> see you.